morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we're delighted to have you here for the devolving restitution uh, session number six, which is going to be our last discussion on the devolving restitution uh, program. Uh, this event is hosted by Afford uh, and the Birmingham Museum, which is our host for today, and Petrifus Museum. I'm Dr. Njavulo Chipangura. I'm the curator of living cultures at the University of Manchester. Uh, so today, the program for today was supposed to end at around 2 p.m., 2.30, sorry. So we're ending slightly earlier than 2.30. We're ending at uh, 2 p.m. So we'll start off by introductions from some of the speakers and the panelists. Uh, the first introduction is going to come from uh, Onyekachi, uh, who's going to speak for five minutes. Then this will be followed by Professor Dan Hicks, who will speak for five minutes, uh, followed by uh, Sarah uh, from the Birmingham Museum, who's also going to speak for five minutes. And then the first session will start off soon after that at 9.45, which is going to be on the history of collecting empire and natural sciences collections, which is on running for 18 minutes. This will be followed by the next session at 11 to 11 to 12.50 on repatriation and restitutions of natural science collections. And then thereafter, we'll have our lunch break between 12.50 and 1 p.m., which will be followed by the last session, session number three on engagement in the UK with a focus on Birmingham, which will take us to around 1.55, where we have the closing remarks from Sarah. So I'm getting it over to uh, Onyekachi for five minutes for the introduction. And this will be followed by, by Dan for five minutes, followed by uh, Sarah for five minutes again. Thank you. Thank you, Jabula. Um, my name is Onyekachi Wambu. I'm the executive director of Afford, and we've been involved in a program called Return of the Icons, um, which is really looking at how um, we can look at issues of restitution and, and campaign for the return to, of artifacts and human remains uh, to countries of origin. So we were invited to participate in these uh, devolving restitution workshops uh, that are taken us from, um, in terms of regional museums, from Glasgow to Manchester, um, Derby, um, to Cambridge, Oxford, and um, now in Birmingham to, for the final one. And it's been uh, an extraordinary journey over the last 18 months, um, understanding the challenges that each of uh, the regional uh, museums uh, face around um, the, the issues of restitution, around the issues of protection and preservation of uh, these artifacts, and also the, the work that they've been doing in 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 allowing greater understanding of the collections. I think over the last 18 months, um, the things that um, we can be proud of that have happened is that, you know, um, the issue of restitution is now firmly on the agenda. Um, and it's uh, <clears throat> the, the conversations are taking place about how to do this, about how to uh, understand the, the collections that we all have. Um, in, in the we all custodians of and how we share greater understanding of, of, of and the uh, understanding the provenance of those uh, artifacts, um, how we improve uh, best practice, how we share knowledge, et cetera. And um, we've seen one regional museum at the end of this period of, uh, as I said, uh, the issue being on the, on the agenda, we've seen one regional museum, the Horniman, for instance, hand back, it's uh, Benin collections and uh, has navigated um, the, uh, the, its way through doing that and will formally um, be doing that later this month uh, um, and begin that process of handing that back to Nigerian and Benin authorities. So not only is the issue on the agenda, but we're seeing huge progress in how this can be done. I think the other things that have emerged over the last 18 months as we've been doing these series of workshops is that, uh, as I said, we've shared a lot of best practice amongst uh, museums um, and we've improved understanding um, of uh, provenance and, and also of the objects themselves. Um, for me, the, the really big, um, you know, positives that have 
come out over the last 18 months is just um, about how we have deepened collaboration um, with two really vital sectors. Um, and for some museums, those relationships were not as strong as they could be, but the two sectors would be with African um, heritage sector themselves, African museums, and also uh, with um, local communities that have, um, that share a heritage with um, some of the collections themselves. And um, I think through the access, you know, through the last 18 months, um, a lot of museums have, you know, many run programs already, but um, I think it's fair to say that um, the workshop have allowed new ways of interacting with those two constituencies. And where there wasn't an active program in place for um, the museums themselves to rethink how they uh, involve those uh, local communities and also African museums in in um, um, telling the stories of the collections and gaining greater understanding of the collections. Um, I think the, the, a long time ago, there was an argument that these uh, artifacts uh, needed to stay here because, um, you know, the museums here were sort of world institutions. And uh, it seems to me that if um, there were truly if that argument even had any basis, um, then it was important that um, the uh, awareness and the knowledge about these uh, artifacts be shared with the places of heritage primarily. Um, um, otherwise, you know, it's not about sort of sitting in 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 Europe or in England or in um, the UK and uh, saying here we are as a centre of. Um, heritage or uh, of world civilization, but um, you need to travel to us to to see your own objects. I think it's really important that that happens. Uh, the final bit that I wanted to just uh, reflect on was really um, around how the museums themselves, as a result of these interactions, have shared um, better practice. And, and how to improve their own practice. And the one area that I, I still am really concerned about, and, um, and you know, we, we're going to be doing further work on, on this area is about, you know, the display of human remains. We know that some of those remains are still there uh, in places like the British Museums of the Mummies. And uh, we just find it really um, unacceptable that, you know, uh, human remains are still on display for people to go and look at on a Sunday afternoon. Um, so if that's one area of uh, um, improved practice, then I, th I think, um, you know, that we're going to continue to work on um, and along all the lines that we've also, I just spoken about, that's, a, you know, what the Ford will be um, moving forward with. Um, for today, we welcome uh, Birmingham, uh, hosting um, the deliberations on, on natural history. And um, we look forward to the program. I'll hand you back um, to the chair. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Onyekachi. Thank you for those interesting remarks. And I'm going to hand it over to Dan, who's also going to speak for five minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been wonderful to be working uh, with Onikachi and Afford over the past uh, two and a half years with the funding from Open Society Foundations. And of course, with this network, which has, uh, you know, we haven't built it sort of you built itself in between the non-national institutions who are represented here. And so I was asked, um, as this is the last of the six workshops, as to whether I wanted at the end of the day to sum up. And I actively said that I don't want to do that. That's not in the spirit of the devolving restitution process. We here uh, who find ourselves in the role of the curators in these legacy colonial institutions, our work needs to involve some, some of the fundraising, some of the opening of doors, but also 
learning actually you know when not to take up space and to allow the conversation to be as at this point at this crucial point for restitution being really you know debated in sort of sort of uh, new ways to allow as uh, many voices in as possible because and i think this is the main point i want to make think about how different it is now to where we were five years ago even or even three years ago where the restitution uh, debates was simply a debate. It was a dialogue. It was, you know, the British Museum or the Metropolitan Museum on one side of the argument in the media coverage saying, we don't like restitution, we want to look after objects. And then, you know, groups or nations who were described as if they were simply activists on the other side of this, you know, debate which felt like it could last forever. There were two sides and you heard out both sides and every time we discussed it, it was as if no one had ever thought of it before, rather than, of course, the fact that restitution has been a central part of the museum's world, of the anti-colonial movements alongside the fallism movements since the middle part of the last uh, century. So we're at this incredible, what's changed, I think, is this devolving process. Look at what's happened with the return of the Benin uh, bronzes, and we no longer are censoring the, um, you know, the, the richest and the most powerful institutions who've been controlling the media narrative since the 1960s. These conversations are happening in more than 160 museums around the world. In between everyone that works in, the, in, you know, in those museums from the leadership and the trustees to front of house, to education, to conservation, uh, and to and to every other aspect of the museum work, but also to stakeholders and to audiences and to those people whom we say we serve. And once you multiply these conversations to have a different conversation in Manchester and in Oxford and in Ipswich and in uh, Belfast and in Edinburgh, and you do that internationally, suddenly we get this moment we're having, which is so optimistic, I think, for, for our sector which is that long-standing issues over restitution are no longer subject to what in the recent piece I wrote for hyperallergic, I listed as obfuscation, as the deeply parochial claim to universalism, as this enduring amnesia that restitution is not a new idea, and above all, the fourth and final of those, the silencing the silencing that can happen in the present, which, as I argued, there is maybe a, the great risk that we see as we see the Arts Council England report on restitution that came out over the summer, as we see some of the interventions from the national museums where restitution is reduced to process. Restitution is stripped of the reasons why we're having this conversation in the, in the first place, because this can't just be about returning the Benin bronzes. This can't just be about, you know, a bit of, you know, of performative work that talks about the decolonial. This can't only be, this can't be about the, maintaining the authority and the innocence of the curator. This has to be about implications. This has to be about the new responsibilities that we, that we hold in these roles. This has to be about the role of the university museum and the civic museum, you know, coming together to critique the role of the museum in relation to the nation state and to enduring colonialism. So for all those reasons, I think of Ford's work, let me just underline their important work with the old party parliamentary uh, group for restitution and reparation. And this is the final point I want to make in the five minutes or maybe six minutes available to me, sorry, um, is that we're talking today about natural history collections. We very much sought in the framing of these conversations to set us, uh, up a series of conversations that went from the obvious, maybe the, you know, the more obvious in our media narratives over the Benin bronzes and the military taking through human remains to what we're talking about today, which is aspects of natural history and so forth. And of course, this is happening at a time where in the media, we hear the debates over COP in terms of <coughs> reparation for the damage that's happened because of environmental catastrophe. How could we see natural history collections as part of that history of extractivism? How do we work within these institutions 
that are deeply implicated in the enduring history of the corporate colonial, militarist aspects of racial capitalism, of the carceral capitalism, of extractivist capital capitalism, of these heteronormative, cis masculine, patriarchal spaces that have this particular relation to extracting not only culture, but also nature. That I think is gonna frame some of the conversations we'll hear today, but at this point, I'm going to switch off my mic and actively sleep for the rest of the day, not to take up any more space. But thank you so much to, to everyone hosting this, especially those colleagues at Birmingham. And a final thank you to everyone who's been involved over the six workshops. It's been so important to see the catalyzation of these conversations from the grassroots. So thank you, everybody, especially funny, final thing, the funders, Open Society Foundation, and also support from Arts Fund and the University of Oxford. So thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you so much. Interesting reflections and really enjoyed the conversation around how do we move from just being a dialogue of institution to talking about how do we practically implement some of the ideas that we've been talking about since the past six sessions. So I'm going to move on to uh, Sarah and Zach, who are going to speak for five minutes uh, and then we'll move to the first session uh, on the history of collecting. Alpha to you, Sarah and, and Zach. Sarah and Zach from Birmingham Museum. Thanks so much for having us. Um, Zach and I are a bit of a double act. We are jointly the CEOs of the museum service. So I'm going to kick us off and then um, Zach's going to speak. We, we might be slightly more than five minutes, I'm afraid. Just a small warning to the chair there, maybe six minutes. But we're six, minutes, six minutes, six minutes. Okay, all right, it's 9.49 now. We'll keep as best of time as we can. So as I say, uh, my name is Sarah Wajid and I am one of the joint CEOs of Birmingham Museums Trust. Um, I, I'm really thrilled that this is happening, that this session is happening today. Delighted, not least because I think I first came to New Affords work 25 years ago. So um, there's a very long uh, uh, sort of journey with Afford and um, watching your work progress over these many years has been really heartening and interesting. And also I'm a trustee of the Pitt Rivers uh, Museum. So I've been watching the work there very closely in terms of um, human rights, uh, reparation and reparative justice. And probably I think um, first spoke to Dan about the Devolving Restitution Project maybe four years ago. So this day is a very special day and it's been coming for a long time. So many thanks to Afford and to Pitt Rivers uh, for putting this uh, together. All of you have been organising this event today in particular. Just want to first lay out a little bit of information, basic background about the Museums Trust. Um, it's one of the largest independent museums trusts in the UK and we curate the city's collection across nine sites, uh, including the Birmingham Museum Art Gallery and Think Tank, which are the two largest of those uh, venues. And our vision for the museum service is to use the collections to generate hope, to build social trust, and to increase a sense of belonging and solidarity, both locally and internationally. The collection holds uh, great significance, not only for the people of Birmingham, but also it reflects the heritage of indigenous communities across the world, including material of great spiritual and cultural significance, important to people alive all over the world today. We are committed to working with Birmingham City Council and international partners to develop discussions and to deliver on restitution of Birmingham's collection. The first step in this process for us is to revise and update our restitution policy and to do this in dialogue with the people of Birmingham. We hope today's discussion will result in fresh discussions with any new partners who are on in the audience um, and who've been drawn to this discussion. So the museum was founded 150 years ago and the collection includes objects and artworks rooted in colonial histories and inextricably linked to Birmingham's role as the second city of empire. Initially, objects and artworks were brought to Birmingham as a source of inspiration for local craftsmen and women, and the goods made here were then often shipped out across the empire. People from Birmingham often travelled as colonial officials collecting materials, including natural science materials and specimens and samples that were brought back. 
these questions of reparative justice and museums, as um, the Anya Kachi and Dan said earlier, these aren't simple logistical questions of process. These are questions of ethics and human rights that go to the heart of how we're living today. Um, I was born in Rawalpindi in Pakistan, a country that has uh, been ravaged by floods this year. Um, and the example couldn't be closer to home for me of the topic there that Dan talked about in terms of the environmental impact and the legacies of empire. On the one hand, museum for me personally, as a child uh, growing up here, were often a refuge. In fact, my parents, uh, particularly my mum used to take me to the natural history museum. So talking about natural science collections today seems, you know, again, very close to my heart. I spent a lot of time as a child playing in the natural history museum, partly because it was an escape from the quite racist environment of our local playground and parks. And it seemed a safer place to my mum in the 1970s for me and my brother to play. But while she was also happy to take us to museums and encourage that, she was also always very clear about the other implications of being in museums for Pakistanis and Indians, particularly the Koinur diamond and its place in you know, British heritage is something that most children you know, from my heritage will grow up with that story ringing in their ears. So coming into museums was very much, um, you know, that was the message from my ancestors was always very clear well before I was working in museums that these are not just objects, that these are questions of rights and human rights. And for those of us who are descended from you know, our ancestors and who have roots in countries like Pakistan, places in Africa, all over the world, it's especially incumbent on us to make good and to have this reckoning with the past. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit very briefly before I hand over to Zach to say that my first engagement with uh, questions, these questions at Birmingham Museums Trust was back in 2016 when I was working with um, others on this call, uh, Lucas Large, Rebecca Bridgman, Rachel Minot, and with six people from Birmingham, um, activists whose names I'm sure will come up later today, um, on the Past Is Now project. And that was a project to consider the legacies of empire and the collections relating to empire in uh, the collection. And I just want to read very briefly the introduction panel that was developed by the co-curators. Um, empire was a bloody business. Many people lost their lives and were traumatized in the creation and retention of empire or in fighting to gain independence from British rule. Although it has officially ended, the empire changed the way in which the modern world was constructed. Its legacy exists in structures such as museums, schools and governments and affects individuals and national senses of identity today. That statement still, uh, you know, stands and would, you know, would serve as a, a perfectly good introduction to the redevelopment of the museum and art gallery that we are embarking on today and we'll be reopening the museum in 2024 and this discussion today will help inform the shape of that museum redevelopment. We're now working actively to return material from the collection to their places of origin. In 2016 we returned human remains to Australia. More recently we've developed um, active collaborations with New Zealand with the New Zealand-based Savage Club Collective to reframe and begin discussions to return oceanic collections. I'll speed up, I'm sorry, I'm eating into time. Natural, the natural science uh, collection makes up a, qu a quarter of, sorry, makes up a quarter of over what the one million objects, artworks and specimens in the collection. And the, this collection is owned, as I said earlier, by the people of Birmingham and curated by the trust on behalf of the council. There are 10,000 cultural objects from Africa, 8,000 of those from ancient Egypt. Um, and those, uh, uh, those objects include 19th and 20th century materials from across Africa, around 2000. And more recently, we've been researching the natural science collection from Africa that numbers 2,700 uh, specimens. We are really at the start of the journey on researching the African collections and this devolving restitution program um, 
working alongside partner, also working alongside partners on the Digital Benin project has been an important learning opportunity and is helping us to reevaluate and reconsider the Birmingham collection. We lack expertise in this collection and with recent support from Afford, we've been actively developing links with organisations in Africa in relation to the natural science collections, including Malawi Museum, the University of Zimbabwe, and in the future, we intend to continue and develop these links for further discussions on restitution. Sorry, Zach, that I took a bit too long, and now I'll hand over to Zach. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, um, for, for, for joining this session. And I hope it's going to be um, a good day. I just wanted to follow up from what Sarah was saying, which is a very quick um, personal reflection, how I first learned about, um, about restitution. That's actually because my father is Ghanaian. And as a kid growing up, I had things like this. This is a, um, a you know, wooden object that my, that my father brought back um, from Ghana. And then I go to museums and you see it and you want to hear about how you know, my connection to Ghana was purely few through objects in other Ghanaians' homes, but then also seeing them in museums. And then it got, it got into the whole understanding about how things um, came to be here. So fast forward to joining the museum, and it's you know, been fascinating to, to understand the, 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 the true reasons how a lot of the collections came to be, and how we, you know, as, a, as an organization can, can listen as dad, as, as dad, Dan, Dan's, Dan's not my dad, um, um, mentioned you know, uh, earlier about opening up the doors and listening. And just last month, I was in Munich, and there's a director of um, Somalia National Museum, who just happened to be saying that because of the civil war, he had photographs of a complete empty museum, and he was really keen to try and find out about collections from Somalia from all over the world. And it turns out we have a small um, collection, and he's now interested in learning more about our collection, with the hope that he can take we can take photographs of it and just share that knowledge. So I just want to really quickly show you this, this sort of like looping around about how restitution is so important and how we as an organization are fully supportive of restitution for lots of lots of reasons that people talk about in the last five workshops, but also my, you know, my personal journey that how it helps those people who are of the world understand themselves um, and can be used, um, used for positive coming out of such a negative um, background. So I just wanted to say thank you all for your time Hope it's a good day, and um, I hope to see many of you in the future. Take care. Thank you, thank you very much, Sarah and and Zach. Uh, I'm now handing it over to to Shelley, uh, who's going to lead us and chair the first session on natural history of collecting the empire and natural sciences collections. Over to you, uh, Shelley, for the first chairing of the first session. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Shelley Anjali Sagar. I'm a PhD student working on repatriation fiction in Indigenous literature and film. So I'm going to be chairing this first panel, and we're really looking forward to what promises to be a brilliant day of exchange and collaboration, as you've already heard from those introductions, and really do hope that you find all these sessions you know, thought-provoking for your own research and practice too. So this opening session aims to examine the impact of the British Empire on the natural world and how this links to the development of UK museum collections. We've got three speakers lined up for you, each of whom will speak for around 15 to 20 minutes. So we should then still have plenty of time for questions and conversations, as I've been told that we will be allowed around 10 to 15 extra minutes. So thank you to the organizers for that. Um, so just a couple of the usual sort of notices before we begin, if I could ask our audience to please just put your questions in the Q&A function, I'll attend to these after the presentations. Um, we will also be recording this session, so if any of our speakers don't want to appear in this, please feel free to turn your cameras off. Thank you. So I think all that remains for me to do at this stage is in to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sadia Qureshi. Dr. Qureshi is a historian of racism, science, and empire. Her first book, Peoples on Parade, published in 2011, explored the importance of displayed people for the emergence of anthropology. She's currently writing a book on extinction and has also recently contributed to supporting decolonization in museums, guidance published by the Museums Association in 2021. So Dr. Qureshi, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Hi everyone, really great to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Rebecca for the invitation and all of you for being here. 
So in my talk today, I want to give you a whistle-stop tour of ideas about extinction, their relationship to empire, and how this creates important issues for museums to consider when thinking about reparation and restitution within the natural sciences or life sciences or anthropology, etc. So let's begin with the fact that over 90% of all beings that have ever lived on Earth are extinct. Given that you're here, you're lucky enough to be in that 10% that have survived. So well done. <laughs> so that's a really strange feel good statistic if ever there was one. But I think it is actually quite important to recognize how, extinction, how important extinction is within the formation of life on Earth. Between 50 and 90% of extinct species were lost in five mass extinctions, such as the one that eliminated the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And we're so familiar with ideas of extinction that it's hard to imagine a world where nothing was believed to be extinct. But that science of extinction and how scientists think of extinction is actually really quite modern. So up until the 18th century, well-known losses such as the Mauritian dodo were attributed to human actions. Arab traders knew of Mauritius for at least five centuries, but they never quite settled there. But then the Portuguese arrived in 1507 and the Dutch arrived in 1598. Effectively, they started using Mauritius as a kind of pit stop for their voyages across the Indian Ocean. And within a century, the bird became so rare that in 1662, a shipwrecked sailor found none on the mainland. Um, he did spot a few on a, a small islet away from the mainland, but that's the last time we know that someone saw a living dodo. <clears throat> it's likely that the species had become extinct by the 1690s. So within decades, human invaders had caused the world's most famous extinction. And crucially, the day, what's really important about the dodo is that it's at human hands, but also it becomes extinct in an era when scholars don't really believe in the possibility of widespread extinction or species loss due to deeply held religious beliefs, such as the belief in design, divine design, providence and plenitude. And this is the idea that God, through creating life, would create, uh, would in his creation would be every living being at all times, because otherwise creation would be flawed. And so this is a really, really important way in which ideas of widespread extinction are, are really, they don't, they don't appeal to people at all. But even non-religious people are quite reluctant to accept the idea of extinction as a, a widespread in the natural world because they know that any species that might appear to be extinct might still be found in unexplored lands. Very, very rarely, naturalists argue that an apparently extinct species might have evolved into a different form, but that is exceptionally rare, in, certainly in the early modern period. So these kinds of issues combined and these beliefs combined give um, create a sense that extinction or certainly believing in widespread extinction um, is really really quite dangerously close to believing um, that either God doesn't exist or certainly that creation is flawed which itself would be problematic but then things change in the late 1800s very, very famously, the comparative anatomist Georges Cuvier builds up his reputation as the world's premier authority on fossils whilst working at the Natural History Museum, uh, the Museum of Natural History in Paris, with collections accumulated from across the French Empire and through Napoleon's deliberate acquisition of the natural history collections of aristocrats across Europe as he wages war. And in 1796, Cuvier publishes a paper comparing the remains of a hairy fossil elephant that he names the mammoth to living examples of both A Asian and African elephants. And he suggests that the Siberian mammoth is clearly a distinct species and extinct. Up until that point, people often think of them, uh, even Asian and African elephants as very, very potentially the same species. So the paper becomes the first of several examining fossilized remains, including one a decade later in which he names another elephantine beast, the mastodon. And Cuvier argues these fossils prove, quote, the existence of a world previous to ours destroyed by some kind of catastrophe. So Cuvier is not the first person to suggest animals can become extinct, 
but his reputation, his detailed anatomical comparisons between fossilized and living species and the significant resources that he has accumulated through imperial acquisition within Paris help establish the notion that species loss and extinction is an irrefutable feature of the natural world, irrespective of human activity. Now, despite the kind of previous reluctance to accept ideas of widespread uh, activity, partly because of Cuvier's research, scientists take up his um, conclusions with very, very noticeable enthusiasm. In less than 30 years, the British geologist Charles Lyell, for instance, maintains that extinction is a routine event in nature due to what he calls a struggle for existence. And of course, that may well be familiar to you um, in, in terms of uh, debates about evolution, that notion of a struggle for existence. So at this point, Cuvier had only ever worked on the remains of fossilized animals, but extinction became accepted and expected in much broader debates on the natural world um, after naturalists began noting the disappearance of living species such as the great orc or passenger pigeon. And so very quickly, people come to think of uh, humans as endangered, languages as endangered, cultures and so on. And of course, within the mid 1800s, evolutionary theories entrenched these ideas about extinction even further within mechanisms of natural selection. And this has very, very serious consequences um, almost immediately. Uh, both for the natural world and for indigenous peoples worldwide. So for instance, in the early modern period, writers sometimes lament that indigenous peoples are being exterminated by European colonists. But in the 19th century, the, that language shifts and ex, it, instead extermination quickly gets conflated with extinction. So whether commentators are discussing Native Americans, various African kingdoms or Aboriginal Australians, the violence of conquest and extermination is deliberately naturalized as extinction. And this becomes so common that by the 1960s, there's an anthropologist called Theodore White who sarcastically observes the white colonizers see themselves as, quote, pious manslayers who act according to the laws of nature which govern the rise and extinction of races. And he's really quite scathing about the way in which white colonizers see themselves as the agents of extinction in this, in this uh, as a kind of uh, enacting a natural law. So this not only leads to a disavowal of extreme imperial violence and genocide, but it also leaves lasting legacies through dispossessing indigenous peoples of their lands with enormous consequences for indigenous land rights. After all, if settler states are able to argue that indigenous peoples no longer exist, then they are also able to argue that land does not need to be returned, which is a profound extension of, it, of extinction narratives and the damage they have already done. And you know the legacies of this are ongoing. So why might all of these historic ways of thinking about extinction matter for museums and issues of restitution? And I think there are multiple ways that these associations between extinction and empire have lasting legacies that we do need to think about in debates about restitution. Some of these issues are already of long-standing concern, but I do think that being aware of how they are linked to histories of extinction adds an important historical dimension to this work. I think the most obvious, firstly, is that ideas of endangerment and extinction underpin salvage collecting. Anyone interested in the history of museums knows that many items come into the collections because they are collected for posterity by people who are thoroughly convinced that they may no longer soon exist. And this applies to a vast number of acquisitions. So for instance, in the late 19th century, when naturalists learned that species might be endangered, we might hope that they would jump to try and conserve them. But what often actually happens is that those species become even more valuable and, and collectors scramble to try and get hold of them for their own collections. So museums hold a vast number of specimens that were collected by people who directly contributed to the endangerment and extinction of species, whether of the passenger pigeon, Caroline parakeet, great orc, bison or tiger. And I think tigers are particularly good examples because they are deliberately targeted uh, for extermination because Victorians believe tigers are absolute vermin. And so they're a good example of a species that used to be considered a threat 
and therefore hunted with impunity and collected with impunity, but which we now recognize as endangered and therefore in need of protection. So that's an important shift in many species that are in natural history collections. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a taxidermic specimen of a tiger which acknowledges that aspect of endangerment, even when those specimens might be labeled as endangered or you know, in need of protection, for instance. But I think that without that context of, uh, we don't really understand the truly horrendous situation we are in with catastrophic species loss and endangerment caused by humans and continuing unabated. Secondly, it's reasonably well known that salvage collecting applies to ethnographic and anthropology collections as much as it does natural history collections. So sometimes ethnographic collection of salvage material is done through recording oral histories in fieldwork, for instance, but it can easily be done via artifacts and even human remains of so-called endangered races. And I think one of the best accounts of this kind of salvage is Joanna Radin's book, Life on Ice. And she explores how indigenous people's blood became a sought after and collectible material rationalized by ideas of salvage ethnography. And what I particularly like about her work and why it's so effective is that she makes explicit how collecting human remains in particular creates damaging effects by removing the possibility of grieving, mourning and laying people to rest because human remains, particularly frozen blood, is then kept in an artificial state between somewhere between alive and dead. And nobody is able to mourn or lay those people to rest because of this kind of in-between state. And given broader debates about repatriation, restitution and human remains, I think there are obvious ethical implications for how to deal with these ideas and histories that do not perpetuate historical violence and contribute to ongoing dispossession based on the assumption of dying or lost races. Thirdly, we are in the middle of an epoch many geologists, geologists want to classify as the Anthropocene and which many biologists and conservationists argue constitute the sixth mass extinction. That language isn't necessarily universally adopted and is controversial in some circles, but whether that language is adopted or not, it's absolutely clear that we are in a period of catastrophic environmental loss that is creating profound inequalities. At a human level, we've seen that this summer, as already mentioned, with the absolutely astonishing scenes of environmental disaster, such as flooding in Pakistan. And we know that many historically marginalized people are now paying the costs of overconsumption in privileged countries. So making those connections between race, empire, extinction, and anthropogenic climate change and biodiversity loss are absolutely essential for broader debates about genuine justice when it comes to who should bear the greatest costs and responsibility for rectifying environmental damage done by industrialization, environmental destruction and rapacious consumption. And I think that's exceptionally important because it challenges the tendency to lump all human beings together as if they are all equally responsible for the situation that we are in with respect to climate change and biodiversity loss, which we know they absolutely are not. And as Pakistanis suffered for, especially this summer, and for me, that raises a much long that it raises the issue of a much longer history of inequality, which can easily perpetuate forms of historical injustice, which need to be thought about with respect to these kinds of collections. And finally, biodiversity loss, I believe, is an obvious example of an injustice when we think of our fellow living beings on this planet. It's becoming increasingly common within discussions of environmental activism to discuss the possibility of justice with respect to a multi-species future. So given how museums have contributed and directly benefited from environmental exploitation, I do think we need to think about how museums can play a proactive and positive role in debates about how we secure futures, not just for human beings, but for the planet and living beings as a whole. So these ideas of multi-species futures. At the very least, I think museums need to be much more explicit about these kinds of histories beyond simply saying which of the specimens are extinct or not, for instance, to acknowledging much more complicated connections between race, empire and extinction. 
So that is just some of the historical background to my own expertise and to some of the kinds of debates that are happening within museums. And of course, you're going to hear about some of the ways in which museums are addressing some of those issues throughout uh, the day. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully we'll look forward to questions and so on. And I'm going to leave it there. OK. Thank you so much, Sadia. That was an absolutely fantastic history of some of these ideas. Um, and I think thank you as well for that real invitation to kind of close and careful attention to these intertwined histories and the critical futures that they then you know, provoke and share as well. Lots to bring together in the Q&A, definitely. Um, I think we will go for, um, oh, there is a question in the Q&A. Um, I think what we'll do is leave these till the end. We'll have our papers first, because I think they'll um, start to bring out questions for all our panelists okay. as well. That's OK, Sadia. Yep. OK, so next up, we are going to hear from Lucas Large, who is the Curator of Natural Science at Birmingham Museums Trust. He started his museum career volunteering before becoming a Skills for the Future trainee with Birmingham Museums. Following this experience, he joined the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, working on lost and found fungi, which sounds like a great project, um, a citizen science initiative looking for some of Britain's rarest fungi. His research interests include the biodiversity of the West Midlands, the history of natural science collections, and the forgotten stories that are hidden in these collections as well. So Lucas, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, it says, uh, host has disabled participant screen sharing. I'm not sure. Uh... Stand on there. Uh, oh, ah, there we are. Uh, excellent. Okay. Um, so uh, over the uh, the past few months, um, Birmingham's involvement in the Devolving Restitution Project has given me the opportunity uh, to research the African natural science collections. Although I was familiar with many of these objects before, I hadn't had the chance to explore the history and provenance of the natural science collection as a whole. So Birmingham Museums and Gallery uh, opened in 1885, but it did not initially have a natural history department or any displays. Uh, after intense lobbying by local naturalists, uh, space was allocated in the um, newly built extension to the museum, and the natural history department was officially opened in 1913. And this photo shows the earliest displays just after they were completed. So uh, this is our, uh, the museum collection center where most of the objects that are not currently on display are stored. Uh, there are an estimated 1 million objects in Birmingham's collection. And of these natural science represents the largest single collection area with around a quarter of a million objects. Of these there are an estimated 2,700 natural science specimens from Africa. And this includes a wide variety of different objects, including 1,900 mollusks, 500 insects, 100 mammals and 55 birds. So civic museums like Birmingham did not usually engage in systematic collection of African natural history. So exactly what is in each collection around the country depends very much on the interests and stories of the collectors who chose to donate their specimens to the different museums. Uh, I've chosen a selection of the collectors uh, to highlight and give a brief overview of who they were and what they collected. So we'll start with uh, Percy Amori Talbot. Um, he was a British anthropologist and colonial administrator who traveled extensively in Africa. Uh, the specimens in Birmingham's collection uh, consist of uh, 40, 49 bird skins from Nigeria. Uh, these were collected during an exhibition, expedition to the Cross River State in 1909. Uh, during this expedition, he was accompanied by his wife, uh, Dorothy Talbot, who seems to have been the more accomplished naturalist and was a very capable botanist and botanical illustrator. But unfortunately, we don't have any of her specimens in the collection. Uh, Percy Talbot's birds have excellent data with them, so they're potentially extremely uh, important and, and scientifically interesting specimens. 
Percy was mainly concerned with the anthropology uh, and of the area and recorded a huge amount of information about the people that he encountered. Uh, this was published in a book called In the Shadow of the Bush, uh, which is available on archive.org if anyone wants to read it. Uh, this does include some information about the natural history of the area, but this is only as a relatively short appendix at the end of the book. So the, uh, the Reverend Henry Wilson, um, so the clergy played a key role in natural history collecting both in Britain and in the empire. Uh, a major reason for this was the popularity of the idea of natural theology. Uh, this was the idea that you could gain religious and theological insights by understanding and studying the natural world. Uh, it's not often that collectors spell out their motives so explicitly, uh, but the Reverend Wilson helpfully did so in his poem called Canst Thou By Searching Find Out God? Um, the Reverend Wilson was a missionary uh, at a, in a small village called in Congo in the democratic now in the Democratic Republic of the Congo from around 1904 to 1939. Uh, he had a wide interest in zoology and collected many different types of animals, including rodents and fish from the nearby Sankuru River. Uh, George Boulanger named the African big-headed snake Hypoptophis wilsoni after him, as he had collected and sent the first specimen back to Europe. Um, the specimens in Birmingham's collection were donated in the 1930s and include a, a queen termite preserved in alcohol and this fantastic cross section of an African forest elephant skull. Uh, according to an inscription um, on it, uh, this was uh, the elephant that it came from was caught in a pit trap at a place called Luzambo in the, it's now in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1911. Another missionary who collected in Africa was Langley Kitching. Uh, he was born in Leeds, but lived for most of his life in the town of Bewdley, not far from Birmingham. He was a member of the Society of Friends, also known as the Quakers, and traveled as a missionary to South Africa from 1877 uh, to 1818. During this time, he seemed to mainly collect marine shells, um, particularly around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, although these all have fairly good locality data that sort of show where he collected them, unfortunately most of them don't have a, a date when they were collected. Uh, as well as specimens, um, uh, five volumes of his diaries have survived. Um, these are currently in the um, Princeton Theological Seminary Library, um, and where they've been digitised, they're now available for anyone to view with, with an internet connection. Um, this shows how important the recent programmes of digitisation are to research into the provenance of natural science collections. And uh, this is Peter Hannay. Um, he was one of my predecessors uh, at Birmingham. He was the keeper of one of the keepers in the natural history department uh, from 1966 until his sudden death in 1976. But before that, he worked for several years in Africa. His first role began in 1957 when he traveled to northern Nigeria, where he spent two years researching mosquitoes in, and malaria. In 1959, he was appointed as the first curator of the Nyasaland Museum. That's the precursor to what is now the National Museum of Malawi. He created the first displays for the museum, which opened just one year later in 1960. Uh, the museum was initially, initially the idea of the Nyasalan Society, now the Society of Malawi, which was formed in 1946. But it wasn't until 1957 that the colonial government took an active interest in the establishment of a national museum and provided funding for the project. The Board of Trustees was chaired by the govern governor of Nyasaland, Sir Robert Armitage, which shows that the colonial government was most definitely wanted to be in charge of the institution. Hanny continued as, in this role as curator until he returned to England in 1964. Uh, one of his main interests was rodents, and he published several scientific papers on the rodents in Malawi. Uh, and this is reflected in his specimens that mainly consist of mammal skins collected just before he returned to England. 
because of these historical links, uh, we've made initial contact with the Department of Museums and Monuments in Malawi uh, and hope to explore the options for uh, further collaboration in the future. Uh, John Medley Wood uh, was someone who also played an important role in establishing institutions that uh, study natural history in Africa. Uh, he was born in uh, Mansfield in 1827 and emigrated with his father to Durban in South Africa in 1847, where he taught himself botany. Uh, he was appointed as the curator of the Durban Botanical Gardens uh, when he began the work in 1882, and he was also the first director of the Natal Herbarium, which is now the uh, KwaZulu Natal Herbarium and still exists today. Uh, we have around uh, 30 herbarium specimens in the uh, collection, and these were included as part of uh, another herbarium that was a collection of plants that was donated to us by the Reverend Hilderic Friend. So uh, Richard Lowe Thompson is an example of a collector who was employed in a professional role in the colonial service, and his his collections are directly related to his job. Um, in 1912, he was appointed as assistant entomologist in southern Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. And he worked for the Department of Agriculture that was based in the capital city of Salisbury, now Harare. Uh, this is an important role as insect pests could decimate crops such as cotton and tobacco that were economically important for the British Empire. His specimens mainly consist of beetles uh, collected in the Victoria Falls and Harare areas during the 1910s. Um, he returned to England in 1917 to fight in World War I, and uh, this seems to put an end to his, his collecting in Africa. This collection is currently being documented and researched by a student from the New Museum School, and we're uh, in contact with Dr. Rudo Sithol, the Senior Lecturer in Entomology at the University of Zimbabwe and founding director of Afrimure, the African Museums and Her Heritage Restitutions. And this will hope to hopefully lead to us working together in the future. Uh, this is uh, a bird collected by someone who we know relatively little about. So he was, uh, Private W. Neath was a soldier who served in the first Royal Dragoons during the Second Anglo-Boer War. And this weaver bird uh, is one of a group of five that he collected at a place called Bester Station in Natal in 1900. Uh, this was while he was on, uh, during, while he was in active service during the Boer War. We don't exactly know why he collected them, uh, but when he returned home, he hired a taxidermist to set them up and uh, stuff them and arrange them in a case. So they must have had quite a lot of value to, um, to him. Uh, these specimens might not be the most scientifically interesting, but they show how natural science objects can have important links to historical events in countries such as South Africa. So um, that was a, a brief overview of some of the African natural science objects and collectors that uh, are represented in Birmingham's collection. Um, these are fairly typical of Britain's uh, civic museums and show the range and uh, types of natural history museums that are present in uh, museums around the country. Uh, there is huge potential to discover more about these collections and make the information available uh, to the countries where the specimens were originally collected. Uh, so thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Lucas. That was a really, really fascinating dive into the history, specific history of these collectors and their collections. Um, and that kind of contextual framing you set out, I think, speaks really nicely to how um, Dan was earlier conceiving of this kind of corporate militarist colonial matrix. It's a really interesting insight into exactly how that works on the ground. So thank you. Um, I'm going to lead into our final presentation, which is from Rebecca Machin, who is a natural sciences curator at Leeds Museums and Galleries. Her interests include the importance of natural science collections in discuss discussions of decolonization and repatriation mm -hmm. in the sector, the representation of gender and sexuality in natural science collections, and public engagement with biodiversity. 
She's currently working on a partnership project looking at the impact of colonialism on environmental conservation in UK overseas territories, focusing on the way in which biodiversity data from these territories and regions has been removed by museums in the UK and elsewhere. She's also in the final year of a PhD examining the history of captive gorillas in colonial Africa. So Rebecca, whenever you're ready. Oh, excuse me. Right, can everyone see my screen there, please? Yep, yep, we can all see. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm really enjoying uh, hearing you all and um, yeah, listening to what everyone has to say. It's great. Um, so many museum collections would not have taken shape without colonialism. Um, and the British Empire effectively funded thousands of well-armed and well-resourced collectors um, and posted them to countries around the world. And these collect collectors were in a position of power um, and able to exploit indigenous people to do the work of collecting. Um, some of these people died in the pursuit of natural history collecting, while others even became part of museum collections themselves. Although some colonized people benefited economically from the trade in natural science specimens, their profits were comparatively small and their importance to collectors was already acknowledged. Natural science specimens exist in our museum collections today as a legacy of the inequitable and sometimes violent history of the British Empire. The wealth held in museum natural science collections, in their data, financial income from visitors, and the scientific and educational resources represents a deficit felt elsewhere. <clears throat> we seek to address this inequity through decolonizing natural science collections, including recognizing and acknowledging this history and taking steps to right persisting imbalances between the historically colonizing and colonized countries. Um, the con colonial nature of natural science collections in museums is so deeply ingrained that it often goes unnoticed by both visitors and staff. But once you start looking, there are examples everywhere. Um, and we're used to working with collections from, um, with specimens from all over the world. And we're conditioned to think that this is just the way that museums are. Understanding the natural history of colonies was important to the British Empire in terms of the knowledge of potential resources and the kudos of scientific discovery. The specimens collected in pursuit of this knowledge by soldiers, missionaries, and other actors in colonial networks were often transported to British museums. And the geographic biases found in European collections today are a result. British museums, for example, contain more specimens from countries in the former British Empire, the regions where Britain wasn't the colonial power. Similarly, natural science material from UK overseas territories, um, which are remnants of colonialism, um, is well represented in British museum collections. Natural science collections in other European countries reflect their own colonial histories. Um, so on the map here, I've just put a few uh, museum specimens, as you can see. Um, and these are, they all form examples of the kind of um, exploitation and sometimes violence that occurred alongside natural science collecting. Um, so at the top left here, we have um, Alfred the Gorilla, who is on display at Bristol Museum and Art Gallery. Um, and we know a lot about his life uh, before he died and became a taxidermy specimen from contemporary newspapers, um, journals um, and uh, scientific papers even about um, Cameroonian adventures. Um, and as well as illustrating Alfred's story, um, they also hint at the work that Cameroonian people um, ended up doing uh, in the work of capturing him, for example, and keeping him alive in captivity before he was exported uh, to Bristol, to live at Bristol Zoo. The um, spring hair on the bottom left here is um, at the University of Cambridge Museum of Zoology. Um, we don't know any particular information about this individual, but its specimen label shows it was collected in a Boer War concentration camp by a British officer, um, illustrating another aspect of the violence of empire. And then thanks to Jack Ashby at uh, the Museum of Zoology for this example. 
Um, on the top right there, you have uh, the classic tiger um, that uh, Sadia mentioned earlier. Um, this is known as a Leeds tiger, uh, just because it's a tiger in Leeds, really. But um, uh, we do know quite a lot about the individual history of this tiger um, and the man who killed it. But we can also use it as uh, an example of the widespread colonial hunting in India, um, which, as Sadia mentioned, uh, reduced tiger populations hugely. So around 400, uh, sorry, excuse me, 40,000 um, tigers in India uh, were reduced to less than 1,800 um, in the space of 100 years of colonial rule. And there's even an example actually of uh, uh, one Maharaja who killed 1,710 tigers, so almost, almost equal to the current population in India. And the plant specimen there at the bottom right is a saw banksia. Um, which is in the Natural History Museum in London. Um, this is also called uh, Wiriyagan by the Cadigal people of Australia, uh, giving an example of the way um, Western science and nomenclature sought to kind of take, take possession of uh, natural science of colonies. Um, this is just one of a huge collection of plants uh, and other natural science specimens collected by Joseph Banks uh, on his expeditions to Australia. Um, also on his list of things he would uh, want for his collection were the head of uh, what he called a New Hollander for his collection. And he was later sent the head of a man called uh, Pemulwi, who was an Eora res resistance leader after he was killed in 1802, um, giving an example there of how human remains were involved in the natural science collections. And thank you again to Jack Ashby um, for that example. So um, as Shelley mentioned, when I'm not uh, being a natural science curator, I'm um, studying um, guerrilla history in, in colonial Africa. Uh, and many of the captive guerrillas that I've been looking at uh, ended up um, having their remains stored in museums. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of guerrillas, um, which often highlight some of the sometimes more extreme examples of the ways in which um, colonial people, uh, excuse me, colonizers exploited um, colonized people. Um, so the American Museum of Natural History in New York uh, holds a group of guerrilla remains from the 1929 to 1931 uh, American Museum of Natural History and University of Columbia expedition to Africa uh, to collect guerrilla uh, remains for anatomical research. And details of the work uh, involved in killing gorillas and transporting their remains um, are illustrated in this description by Henry Raven, who was the expedition's leader and hunter. Um, so examples that I've highlighted are um, the fact that once they'd gone through the risk of killing a, a gorilla, um, they had to travel, uh, had to carry the gorilla remains for um, 12 miles uh, on a path that was only a foot long and had to be uh, wide, had to be widened to 10 feet for, for 12 miles. So you can imagine a huge amount of work just to make the path uh, on which to take the gorilla from the forest. Um, and this journey took two and a half days. Um, and during this, there were some severe storms. So um, the uh, uh, people involved, the Congolese people involved, um, had to endure the cold and the rain with very little shelter um, or any kind of protective equipment that obviously um, Raven, the, the, uh, the white hunter, would have had. Oh, I should say, sorry, this was um, this gorilla here, you can just see him on top of the litter here, was um, collected in 1929 in Shibinda in the um, former Belgian Congo, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. So although these um, archival material can give us some nice details, well not nice, but uh, useful details um, about the work involved in collecting museum material, um, this clip from a CBS film made some years after the expedition um, shows more immediately the kind of conditions that uh, African people were expected to work under. Uh, and I should worry that this is quite um, disturbing. If I can get it to play. Okay. So Raven estimated that a uh, combination of this gorilla's weight of 460 pounds, along with the, the litter that they had made for him, 
um, would have weighed about 600 pounds or 272 kilos. And if you notice there, um, as they sat up the corpse of the gorilla, some saliva came from his mouth, um, which is quite a immediate example of how uh, people involved in these uh, kinds of labor would have been exposed to um, the various diseases. So oh, going back to the good old uh, British Empire, um, uh, the Power Cotton Museum in Kent um, has the largest collection of gorilla material in the UK. Um, this is curated by Rachel Jennings, who's been incredibly helpful uh, to me in my research. Um, so thank you very much to her for access to the collections. Um, as well as the gorilla remains, um, they also house the archives of Percy Powell Cotton, who uh, owns the uh, house there where the, the museum is now set, and his associate, uh, Fred Murfield, um, who was a hunter based in Cameroon. Um, so a combination of these specimens and the archives can tell us more about the ways in which uh, people in Cameroon were exploited to collect museum specimens. Um, so this gorilla was shot in 1997. Um, a couple of years later, we've got details of uh, a gorilla roundup, as they called it, um, in which gorillas were killed uh, as well as captured. Um, this little snippet from Percy Powell Cotton's diary uh, makes reference to the injuries that Cameroonian people sustained during the gorilla hunt, um, including a spear through uh, the leg that had to be pushed through in order to get it out, um, bites from gorillas uh, and yeah, other, other things like that. Um, and this photo here, I'm afraid it's not very, really, might not be very clear on your screens, but um, this person is standing next to gorilla skins, which have been um, spread out for drying. Um, just hinting at some of the labour that goes into preparing the specimens after they've been collected, and again, exposing people to the risk of disease. Um, there is a um, collection of Fred Murfield's correspondence, um, also held at uh, the Powell Cotton Museum, um, and the language he uses in his letters to Powell Cotton um, not only give us more information about the kind of things that Cameroonian people were um, exploited for, uh, including wet nursing, captive young gorillas, um, but um, also gives the impression of the power that he held in the community he was living in. Um, even though Cameroon at that time was under French rule, or that area of Cameroon was under French rule, um, as a kind of fellow European, Murfield was, um, had the responsibility to mete out justice to some extent. Um, which included the physical abuse of people, including whipping with a hippo-hide whip. Um, he was also um, had the authority to get uh, people imprisoned, even in relation to his own guerrilla collecting exploits. So none of these abuses would have happened if it hadn't been for uh, the collection of what is now museum material. Um, another example, my last example, is um, the uh, Akeley a uh, hall of African mammals in the American Museum of Natural History, again, um, a very famous gallery, uh, which features taxidermy by um, Carl Akeley. Um, he killed several Eastern gorillas or mounted gorillas in the former Belgian Congo, uh, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, to make this display. Or rather, uh, he got credit for that, um, if you could call it that, um, but he employed um, hundreds of people to um, enable this expedition. Um, so in a book written by Mary Hastings Bradley, who um, accompanied him along with her child and her husband on this expedition, um, here are some illustrations of the kind of activities that collecting these specimens uh, involved. Um, so the porters were involved uh, in carrying huge amounts of equipment, including a lot of unnecessary equipment um, between bases. Uh, they were also used to carry the small child that came on the expedition with them. Um, in terms of preparing museum material, um, here's a picture at the top right here of Carl Akeley uh, working on some gorilla skins. Um, but obviously, uh, Congolese staff were also employed to do this as well. Um, and again, working with remains like this uh, really had the potential to, um, to spread disease to humans. 
so um why does this matter um we've got um in the Akeley hall of uh african mammals is basically a, a whole gallery named after Akeley, but the hundreds of people who worked with him and for him uh, to collect these specimens require uh, receive no credits or, or no mention at all and certainly not by individual names um and i've been to this gallery it's it's absolutely amazing and um despite my kind of uh, disapproval of the, the processes involved in catching the gorilla, killing the gorillas for display. It is a, a, a really impressive display. Um, however, at the moment, um, adult entry to, to visit the gallery is $28, and children are $16. Um, so it's not the most accessible in terms of um, education or uh, access to people. Um, and obviously, if you don't live in New York, that makes life a bit more difficult. Uh, but does this really matter? So um, in 2018, Cooper and Hull uh, published an amazing catalogue of um, gorilla remains, 234 pages long, um, and included many thousands of specimens held all over the world. Um, so I had looked through these, and um, if we look at gorilla specimens, obviously just one, well, two species, but um, a very small proportion of museum collections worldwide. Uh, but looking at this, um, the UK currently holds a quarter of all gorilla specimens in the world, and the US holds another quarter. Um, Africa at the top there has only 2%. Um, so in terms of accessing collections for all the things that we value our collections for, uh, people in Africa have very little access to material that came from Africa. Um, and given that both species of gorilla are critically endangered, this doesn't seem to be the best distribution of uh, gorilla specimens, uh, either for gorillas or for people. Um, so looking at the provenance more closely of gorilla remains, um, of the many thousands of gorilla remains in the in, uh, Cooper and Hull's catalogue, uh, 2,997 2, were provenance. So I had a look at where they were from. Um, Almost half were from Cameroon. I think, uh, well, quite a quite a chunk of them were from uh, Fred Murfield, um, and also large amounts from Gabon, um, Equatorial Guinea, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Republic of the Congo. So there we've got a mixture of German, English, French, and Spanish ex colonies. Um, if you look at um, the DRC. Republic of Congo, Cameroon and Gabon, um, a huge number of um, the specimens around the world are from those places, but they don't have any um, gorilla remains in their country. Uh, and um, the only ones in Africa, uh, which are a small number, um, aren't available in public museums in countries where gorillas still live, um, which I find is problematic. Um, so what can we do about this? Obviously, we're talking today about repatriation and data sharing. Um, I know there will be further discussion about this later, so I won't, uh, I won't settle on this. Uh, equally, there will be more later today on public engagement. Um, here are just some images of, I should say, a much, much bigger signs are a lot more easy to read um, about some of the stories of some of the specimens at these museums and galleries, which we've um, recently included in decolonizing our uh, natural science displays. So we're looking a lot more explicitly about where our collections came from um, and the role of natural science in colonialism. Uh, but I think another aspect of decolonizing our collections and looking at um, restitution is working more effectively with, uh, with partners overseas. Um, at present, Leeds Museums and Galleries are partners with a whole range of different uh, institutions, including the National Trust in the Cayman Islands and in Montserrat, both UK overseas territories, um, looking at uh, the legacies of race, social injustice and exclusion and how colonialism has affected um, environmental conservation, which, as um, Sadia mentioned earlier, um, is closely linked with collecting and colonialism. So the Montserrat uh, National Trust runs the National Museum in Montserrat, 
Uh, it's a small museum for, for a small place, but it's got some beautiful collections. Um, but notably, it doesn't have, for instance, any Montserrat Orioles, which are the nat national bird. Um, here are some examples on GBIF of, uh, I think these are from the Natural History Museum and the Smithsonian, I'll have to remind myself. Um, yeah, and they're not, uh, they're not able to access funding from the Museum Association, for instance, which is the UK Museums Association, even though um, they are part of the UK overseas territories. Um, so just to sum up, um, as natural science curators, um, and as Lucas uh, was a great example of, um, we're learning more about the, uh, the colonial history attached to our collections. And many of us want to learn more. Um, but the key thing I think is that it, decolonization isn't just for human collections, um, but also that natural science collections are human collections. They're only in our museums because of people and uh, people's relationships with one another. And the remains from, of animals from once colonized countries have the potential to reveal stories of the people whose lives were affected by colonization. Um, looking in the long term, um, the legacy of empire is evident in the colonial nature of conservation in ex colonies today, which uh, continues to impact the quality of life of many African people in a way that isn't sustainable for people or for wildlife. Um, looking into what Sadia said about um, the, yeah, the links between colonialism and extinction. Um, and I think we need to be a bit more creative about who we uh, work on partnerships with. Um, as I mentioned, there aren't any museum galleries displaying gorilla remains in the countries in which gorillas live. Um, but there are lots of other organizations and institutions, educational establishments, um, and that we maybe need to be more creative about who we make links with um, and who gets to make the decisions about where these remains are kept. Um, so decolonizing our collections can help us engage our audiences with a range of political and environmental issues uh, still relevant today. Uh, and we can use our collections to help people and work life um, if we just carry on with decolonizing. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was that was a brilliant overview um, of your research and the kind of context, multiple contexts that you're working in. Um, and thanks to all our panelists on this session for those really fantastic talks. There's, I think, a lot to get into um, in all those insights into your research. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, we have got a good amount of time for questions, and we've got some that have been posed in the Q&A function. If I can just remind our audience, please do post any questions that you have um, for our panelists in that function, and I can just ask them. Um, if I could ask our panel to turn on their cameras, that would be great. Yes, I can see them all. Okay. Um, okay, so we have got a couple of um, questions that have been posed in the chat. So I think there's one really for all of you um, that might be a nice way of sort of opening up this conversation. So we've got a question that um, is asking, or setting out the context that very often when work like this decolonization work in museums has begun, it can get diluted before it's had a chance to be done properly. Um, because, you know, the agenda might get weakened by other claims, political pressure, and perhaps needs to replicate this work to focus on other collections. Um, I think the speaker is asking as a matter of priority. So the question is, how can we collectively ensure that the work that we are doing here that you are all doing here doesn't lose momentum as a result of competing claims potentially. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to kind of kick off and get us into some of that. I, I'm happy to say my uh, uh, my feelings on that. So yeah, go ahead. Um, so I think um, I don't think the person who asked this question uh, asked it in this spirit, but I think um, something we kind of have to push back up against is um, the idea that you know, really aren't there, aren't there bigger problems or aren't there more important things, for instance, human remains um, to deal with first in terms of repatriation uh, and restitution. Um, but I think um, as natural science curators, um, particularly if we've, um, if we don't have human remains involved in our collections, that's something we can do to help with restitution and that could be part of our jobs. So um, 
while I think human remains and sacred objects have an, a huge, huge importance in terms of repatriation, I think as natural science curators, we can we can try and be bold and stick to our guns as it were for yeah quite a colonial phrase but anyway um and you know we the thing we can do is we can do the stuff around natural science collections so um and 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 also it's interesting it's interesting for us and our audiences um so it doesn't have to be something that impacts negatively on other areas of our work i think yeah thank you does anyone else want to kind of chip in with that Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to say, I mean, it, it is, it is a, you know, it, it's definitely an issue. And um, yeah, it's, I don't think it's anything that necessarily has an easy solution to it. I think it is just, um, yeah, we just have to be aware that that is a danger and try and uh, try and try and fight back against it. But obviously, yeah, there, there is always the possibility that, um, yeah, different priorities change, different projects come along. It's, um, yeah, it can be difficult to, to maintain the momentum. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely an issue. Mm. Sadia, do you have anything you want to contribute? To? Um, I was just going to say, for me, a lot of this comes down to telling the truth, partly because I'm a historian, because I think a lot of people see museums as these kind of neutral spaces and want to preserve the status quo because they see it as neutral. But certainly as a historian of museums, as a historian of natural sciences, of collecting and so on, I find that really, really troubling because there's so much erasure and so on involved. And for me, and I've been in conversations where people will say, but, you know, these are very, very difficult histories or, you know, this is extremely one sided to tell this kind of thing. And I think that's that argument can only be made if you take what exists as the default position of objective authority and I think that needs to be pushing needs to be pushed back against so for me the motivation is always about making historical truth better known like I know that sounds quite fanciful but it really is comes down to a commitment to a truth and then there of course there are other kinds of political kind of commitments and stuff involved that need to be negotiated between everybody whether that's you know um communities to which these materials belong and so on but ultimately I, I personally I don't find anything that is a commitment to the truth demotivating mm, yeah thank you everybody I think the really nice thing about this particular focus on natural science collections as well is that we have seen perhaps you know an increased focus on um, restitution of human remains in particular or sacred and secret objects um, in the more recent past but now as kind of climate crisis pressures are um, developing at a really fast rate, this is actually the place that natural science collections, you know, meet with those histories. So I think that's potentially also one way of thinking about these kind of consistent and potentially competing pressures. Thank you, everybody. Um, we've got a very big question that I would like to ask you all, because I was also wondering this. Um, I think, um, yeah, we've got a question that is, what does decolonization in the case of natural science collections actually translate to in practically changing museums as institutions? And the question, um, the, the asker of this question has also specified that when we recognize that before this um, scramble for decolonization, museums have historically been shaped by and operated within conventions and traditions that remain still largely unchanged. A really, really great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, Rebecca, you started last time, so Sadia, maybe we'll, we'll start with you this time. Oh boy. Well, I think it depends on the museum, uh, the specific institution and the communities involved and what they want. For some museums and for some communities, I think we have to admit that decolonizing will mean that some institutions will no longer exist in their current form at the very least. But on the other hand, I think there are ways, and I've seen examples of this, where people do want to maintain collections and museums, but they do want to be involved with either co-collaborations or co-curation or like reconfiguring the way things are displayed and stuff. And for them, that is meaningful enough for it to matter. But I don't think there's any way of saying that there's one form of decolonizing that will that will be acceptable to everybody involved, partly because museums themselves are such heterogeneous spaces in terms of the collections and things that they have. And of course, it also, you know, if we're thinking about the museum that's been built in Lagos, you know, 
that is a very specific kind of endeavor and what that would mean to, for, it to, for it to be decolonial for it's for the communities who have built it that's a very that's a very different kind of question as well so I, th I think it's tricky but I do think we have to admit that there are a range of options not all of which will be acceptable to everybody and many of which people working with museums might not necessarily like but if museums are to survive at the very least there needs to be engagement with those kinds of issues. Thank you. Um, do either either of you two want to give your opinion on that question as well? Rebecca, I noticed that you use the term decolonization quite a lot, so maybe I'll just pick on you. <laughs> um, yes, no, I um, I agree with what Sadia said, and um, yeah, I think up till now, um, in terms of natural science collections, especially, um, there's been next to no practical change happening um, and I think I think a key thing um, that we need to get better at doing uh, is accepting that we need to let go of the decision making and let go of some of our objects actually and it's although museums have often been seen traditionally in the past as um, places to keep objects safe and I think that's still a a good important role for museums I, I think we need to think about who we're keeping them safe for and why we're keeping them safe so um uh i think for instance gorillas which are the things i think about most of the time um you know i i like working with gorilla material because i'm interested in gorillas but equally i know that there's nothing i can do with them that would be nearly as useful as if they were being used in Africa, for example, to help build relationships between people and gorillas, um, or to mend the kind of colonial nature of conservation efforts of gorillas. Um, for instance, people who've been moved from their homes in order to um, uh, give space, I suppose, to gorillas. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think, I think the trouble is, well, one of the main problems with anything around reparation uh, or, uh, and repatriation is, um that we can talk a lot and in the end we're still the ones who have the objects and we're still the ones that get to make the decisions um and actually until people in the countries from where these specimens came from get to be the decision makers uh, and are given all the information they need to make decisions about where they would like specimens to be um then it, it is to be honest a lot of a lot of hat and no cattle um until that point so I think that's the main change that needs to happen um, and in the meantime things like decolonizing galleries or sharing data and finding out more about different collections uh, it's all great and it's all helpful but in terms of practical change that's kind of a prelude I think and Lucas anything further that you want to add to this I think uh, yes. I think they've uh, they've covered most of uh, yeah Covered it very well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think those were those were brilliant answers to a very difficult question. So thank you. We have a couple of um, specific questions for um, you all. So uh, Rebecca, first of all, um, we've got a question that isn't it about time that we catalogue local indigenous names, such as some of the ones that you mentioned as well. Is this work going on, for example, in your collection? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's something I feel quite strongly about. So apart from anything else, um, the local indigenous names for animals um, and plants, particularly, for instance, um, examples in Australia and, and New Zealand, um, in my opinion, they're just they're usually much better, more pleasant names uh, and have more link to what the species actually are than, uh, you know, some white man's name, uh, which is what they often get replaced by. Um, yes, I think it it would be ideal in terms of um, decolonizing the way we manage collections. If, for instance, our museum databases had fields for indigenous names, or if we simply made the decision when uh, labeling or um, managing our collections to prioritize indigenous names over um, scientific names, um, I think that would be something that a lot of people would feel uncomfortable with. But I think it's something we could also get used to quite easily and we'd also learn a lot by doing that. Um, something we've done in the, the Leeds Museums and Galleries, uh, Ga yeah, Life on Earth Gallery, is to um, acknowledge 
indigenous names more, particularly in the New Zealand and um, Australian fauna. Um, and yeah, I think that's something that needs to become more standard in, uh, in natural science as well as other collections. And I should say, yeah, sorry, Jack Ashby at Cambridge is doing some a lot of work around that and the Oxford Museum of Natural History, is, uh, as well as Pitt Rivers, is doing a lot around labels and nomenclature and that um, different taxonomic interest groups are also pressing to have um, basically racist scientific names um, replaced. Um, so it's, yeah, it's happening in a kind of piecemeal way, but it is starting to happen. Thank you. Um, do any of any of the other panelists want to kind of come in on that? Is this kind of work going on in your institution, Lucas, for example? Um, this isn't something that we've done in Birmingham yet, but certainly something that we'd be open to. Um, but I think as well, I mean, the, 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 the name is, yeah, it's not just a name. A name is part of a culture, it's part of a language. Um, so I think it's it's also an, and, uh, and an acknowledgement of sort of indigenous knowledge about the natural world. Um, but yeah, so I think I think it's not only uh, we don't only want to kind of take the name from a book and add it to a to an object. I think it's also important to um, yeah use that as an opportunity to engage with native speakers of that language and actually sort of um, consult with them about the, the the sort of right name to to call the different objects in the collection. I mean, we could just be almost like replicating some of the uh, the mistakes of the past if we just sort of impose these these names on on objects without that that kind of dialogue. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Thank you for raising that. Um, and we've got Sarah here as well. Do you want to do you want to come in and speak a bit more about this? Thanks, Shelley. I just um, I just sort of thought in terms of Birmingham museums, it would be. I just wanted to kind of add a bit really to uh, what Lucas had said there in terms of natural science collections. I think you know, on the one hand, they're not the collections that come to mind or are often feature in headlines when we, you know, think about restitution. When I was explaining to some people, you know, outside this, you know, museum world, what I was doing today, um, is that so, okay, restitution, but how does that relate to natural science? Well, I don't really get that. And, <clears throat> well, yeah, actually, I can understand why you don't get that, because, you know, people think of Benin bronzes, or they think of human remains, and when you think of natural science collections, you know, you often, most people will think of, you know, how they're displayed in museums are like butterflies and cases and that sort of thing. And the two don't necessarily, you know, connect in most obviously in people's minds. But actually, when I think of the collections in a broader sense, when we think of, you know, some of even some of the themes that we were looking at in the past is now back in 2016, 17 you know, co-creators were asking of Lucas things about mahogany, things about rubber. Why are these minerals, why are these <clears throat> kind of materials in these other collections and how do they come to be here? And why don't you talk about this in the museum? Why do you only talk about this mahogany clock in terms of, you know, the, the properties of the clock or the person who made them? It runs throughout the collections and the appro approach to intellectual property and indigenous knowledge also runs throughout the collection. So questions of decolonized decolonizing in relation to these collections are in some senses no different than they are to the rest of the collection it's just that we need to do a bit more work to reveal and excavate in that sense some of the kind of assumed knowledge and some of the assumed practices that need work just because it might not be at the top of the list in terms of public um, awareness uh, in the way that human remains or iconic uh, and more familiar or very obvious um, collections are. It doesn't mean they're any less important. So in terms of that question about how do we <clears throat> stop other priorities shuffling these priorities down, ultimately that's a leadership responsibility, you know, and that actually, yes, it's partly what, a question for Lucas to answer, but it's also a question for Zach and I and the trustees. It is our responsibility as leaders to uh, implement that and to you know defend this priority yeah absolutely I'm really glad that you that you kind of came in there that's that's a really important thing and it is great to have people who are you know very kind of engaged and switched on with these questions as well I think also there's a real you know there's an interesting point here about um you know who we objectify and what we objectify who we objectify and who we animalize potentially as well that potentially leads to kind of thinking about what is a priority and what isn't potentially. 
Um, I think we've got time for one final question before we finish. Um, there's a question for Sadia, um, which I think would be really important to attend to. Um, the question is that colonizers targeted spiritual objects from communities. Is this an example of extinction through their removal? So I don't want to speak about all indigenous communities as a homogenous, um, but I think potentially it could be. For instance, if it's targeting spiritual practice in a way that removes objects from circulation and use in a way that means that, you know, important practices are no longer possible, or if it's about taking away identity um, and the possibility um, for kind of existence in that kind of way. The other way I think it could be is, for instance, incarcerating ancestors, you know, treating, uh, making ancestors into museum objects and so on, and treating them as incarcerated subjects that then cannot belong to the community or exist within the community in ways that takes away from um, people's abilities to live as community. So I think there's, there are ways that it could be, but I don't want to say that it always is, because I think it depends so much on what those objects uh, on what those ancestors mean to the communities from which they come from. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really important, important clarification um, and a really nice kind of point to close us out on actually as well, you know, really kind of centering the people who are at the heart of this, which are those communities who are multifaceted and hold different opinions and making sure that we're kind of attentive to that and hold space for that as well. So I'm gonna draw us to a close. Um, because we are just kind of running out of time. But thank you so much to all of you. Really fantastic presentations. And I'll hand back to our main chair to take us into um, the next session. Uh, thank you very much, Shelley. And thank you very much, Lucas, uh, Sadia, and Rebecca for the interesting uh, presentations. So we're going to break for 10 minutes, come for break. And then we'll come back for session number two. So let's be back around 24 minutes past 11 UK time. Then we'll continue with session number two, which is going to look at uh, repatriation and restitution of natural science collections, collaborative approaches to data knowledge and sharing. Thank you. We'll break for now and we'll see you again in 10 minutes.
Hello, uh, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope all of you have returned back to the second uh, session of our conversation today on the devolving restitution uh, session or workshop number six. So in this uh, next session, we're going to listen to presentations on the repatriation and restitution of natural science collections, collaborative, collaborative approaches to data and knowledge sharing. Uh, our first speaker uh, on this panel is going to be Solomon, and I'm going to quickly introduce Solomon uh, uh, to the audience. Solomon is a conservation biologist pursuing his PhD in political ecology uh, at the University of Odenberg in Germany. He has worked with several natural history museums in Uganda, the US, and Europe, and holds a master's degree in biodiversity and collections management. Uh, although his current doctoral research examines the roles of knowledge production and representation, law and power in defining regulating global commons, he continues to conduct independent consultations in African museums, natural history collections of African origins and in various projects. Solomon, uh, I hand over to you. You are going to speak for 10 minutes and then the next speaker will be uh, Mike uh, will also speak for 10 minutes. Over to you, Solomon. Um, thanks. thanks. Um, you can hear me, right? Perfectly well. Continue. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. I will share my screen. Um, and do we present a more? Okay, um, thank you very much. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I will uh, present uh, something about the state of East Africa's natural history collections, um, a survey that I did uh, as part uh, of uh, also something that led to uh, my master's thesis, but a project that uh, started independent of that. And yeah, and so of course, as you've heard from my background, I have. Uh, uh, my background is conservation biology, and I had worked with several museums, and uh, I was intrigued by, of course, uh, the fact that biodiversity assessments are biased taxonomically, but also in society preferences. And of course, uh, large deficits uh, also exist uh, uh, in Africa, uh, which also has a large share of uh, threatened species. So, and of course, there are emerging issues that also have been had had have, have been. Uh, coming up, including uh, research becoming more and more costly, but also restrictions uh, to access uh, natural uh, uh, nature, um, for instance, through uh, the Nagoya Protocol. And of course, this is why natural history collections is not something that I should be explaining now, but why they should be, why they are very important um, institutions. Um, and of course, we know lots about museums elsewhere, let's say in Europe, in, in, in North America, and so on. And my question, of course, after uh, uh, working with several museums, I, I realized that we know very little about collections or, let's say, museums in Africa. And you can do that. You can Google search and, and try, to, try to figure out uh, what is happening there, and you might uh, end up finding very, very detailed information. And so what I was kind of trying to do is to define, uh, to try and find uh, their uh, uh, present state uh, regarding their function, different functions, but also what I also did, uh, I kind of uh, did a public survey uh, to try and see how uh, citizens in Africa um, uh, perceive and understand these institutions. Um, there is a lot uh, in there, but I try. I will try to summarize that uh, in what kind of uh, became uh, an assessment uh, uh, where I looked at different categories, uh, given my background and training in collections, uh, and of course knowing what should what 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 you know good uh, could look like. But also, I allowed uh, uh, staff and and people uh, from music from the museums to kind of do their own assessments, which didn't really uh, differ much from, from mine. And of course, I we did uh, give uh, this uh, quite a criteria where five was very good and uh, one, which was the lowest um, uh, uh, possible. And um, yeah, and many things were not really um, 
working well. Of course, uh, these are just uh, visual things for you, uh, but in that um, article, which uh, we'll show in the next slide, uh, it kind of uh, explains exactly what was there. So it's up to uh, the reader also to make their own um, conclusions. So, and of course I did a SWOT analysis after that, which kind of uh, looked at what the strengths were and the weaknesses of course, but also the threats and opportunities. And some of these I, I mentioned here, for instance, uh, you can see that uh, I did find not that many uh, collections as I had thought in the, in the start of, of course, uh, but also many of them were in a poor state and of course, there was also a lack of public and government support, which is not just a problem in Africa, but also everywhere. But essentially here, this was a real, real, real problem. And many people I talked to also in the public did not even care about a museum that was very close to them. So these, these, these were important issues for me. And of course, there were also this urgent need to develop capacities for research and of course, to maintain existing collections. What resulted was uh, after my work I did uh, uh, together with some colleagues apply for a summer school and uh, got uh, uh, something uh, about 200 or something like that euros uh, for a summer school um, to kind of be able to help uh, 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 boost research but also collections as infrastructure. And there um, uh, we are talking about repatriation. And of course, uh, if you read that article, uh, you realize that I talked about a mid restitution um, debate. The thing is during my, um, uh, during this project around in 2018 came this science of all reports that generally talked about um, uh, restoring access of, uh, you know, uh, uh, expiring access for Africans, you know, to, to be able to access um, their own works, of course, after numerous complaints uh, uh, from African countries. And of course, just here in 2018, I think this was the real spark if you also go back and try to look into uh, where this debate becomes to be uh, very, very, uh, yeah. Um, and, and, and so, yes, and so of course, uh, before I did my research, I was also curious, how about natural history collections when we talk about this, where the natural history collections that come into play? Uh, these are things that I put in my slides, but I think people have already talked about in the earlier sessions. The species were killed, of course, during the colonial period. Some went extinct. If you think about, for instance, the white rhino, this is one of the periods that uh, the, that it was really, really hunted. Um, and of course, they ended up uh, coming back to, to life uh, uh, in, in, in the sense of exhibitions in, in uh, museums. Uh, and collections, but of course there was also there is a problem when it comes to staging of African nature and people. And many many of you probably know about this story of Sarah and the Batman. But uh, this is not just um, uh, uh, it's, it's it's not innocent, and on, in any case, it also leads to other problems. For instance, uh, presenting Africa as a place where there are no uh, uh, people, and it's just you know wilderness and stuff like that, which of course later led to many other problems, including um, uh, uh, aspects of eco-fascism where um, uh, national parks are made and, you know, but we always ask the questions of for whom and, 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 and who owns them anyways. Yeah, um, but um, beyond this, uh, 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 I did have questions uh, that I talked, we talked uh, and we discussed uh, with many of, the, of my interviewers, the interviewees, yeah. And um, uh, the question was whether this was first of all restitution, whether restitution was a debate that was already existing in these institutions. And for many of them, it was completely new. So I kind of was uh, introducing this, but also whether once they understood, I mean, for big museums like the National Museum of Kenya, there were people who were already aware of this debate. But for most museums, they were not. And of course, for those that were uh, aware, the question was whether uh, this was uh, the most important bit for them, you know? And so I kind of uh, uh, saw questions beyond uh, just uh, what was about restriction, which now I think I will just let uh, for, for the audience to uh, ask questions. But some of the questions are, what is the significance of specimens in Africa? Because uh, me, my aim was more or less to look at to look up uh, on, on this uh, from the 
from the inside out and not from outside in. And so, and of course, things like opportunities exist for long-term collaboration, but why have they not been utilized? And of course, the future of natural history uh, research in, in Africa uh, are using collections given uh, the challenges that uh, I kind of um, found there. And with that, I, I would love to thank, of course, uh, several uh, people who were a part of this research and of course, the institutions that participated, but also thank you, the audience for, uh, for being here. And, yeah. uh, thank you very much, Solomon. Uh, if any one of you have questions for Solomon, can we put them on the chat? Then we can uh, discuss them once the other presenters finish in this session. So our next speaker is going to be um, Mike. Uh, I'm going to introduce Mike before he starts speaking. Mike uh, is a curator of zoology uh, and anatomy at the Ontarian University of Glasgow. He has lived, studied, and worked there in many countries around the world. He started his museum career with Glasgow, working on the Kelling Group Redevelopment Project first as a researcher and then becoming a curator of nine insect invertebrates, as well as developing many of the multidisciplinary displays. He has worked on cataloging and uh, Deacon projects. Then he moved to the University of West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago uh, to become the curator of zoology. There he developed the museum, undertook research on many topics, including discovering several new species. Uh, he started his career at Ontarian in 20, 2021 and has been getting to know the collections since then, developing new exhibitions, outreach, and research projects. I'll hand it over to you, Mike. You're going to speak for 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. I, and thank you, Solomon, for starting the session. I, I'm just, oh, I still disabled uh, participant screen sharing at the moment. No. Uh, still can't share my screen. Can anyone fix that? There we go. There we go. Right. Okay. I will. Good morning, everybody. I and I. I'll just get on with um my talk this evening. Um, talk this morning is a bit of a, a a mix of three different things. I'm really talking about opening up natural history collections in general. I so to begin with. I'm going to be looking at uh, what we have in the Hunterian African Natural History Collections, because this is how I sort of was brought into this workshop. I, Lucas, who spoke earlier this morning, I sent out a, a request to museums and collections around the UK I, to find out more about what they had from Africa in their collections. And I responded, and this led to uh, further chats. Um, and then so we asked me to come along and join in. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about after that is data sharing, which some of our other speakers have touched on as well. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about a developing repatriation project. Uh, that's just kind of in the early stages at the moment, um, but is showing much promise. Okay, so our collections in uh, the Hunterian and University of Glasgow, um, I had a look on our database and we found 756 specimens which mentioned Africa as being the locality for where they came from. Uh, but that's only catalogued so far. I'll go into that more in a moment. Uh, these date from before 1783 up to the present day. Um, many of the early ones came in through William Hunter bequest, and that included many shells, uh, such as the, the cone shell you can see there, uh, many insects as well, um, and a few uh, bird and mammal specimens. And then over the years, various academic staff and students have um, been conducting research uh, in Africa and have brought back specimens. Uh, we've had many donations from members of the public as well. Um, some who have, will have had uh, spent time in Africa uh, with work or research themselves. And we've also purchased quite a few um, specimens too. Uh, things such as the taxidermied eye eye in the photograph there I were purchased by um, the Zoology Museum here for developing our displays. And these came from companies such as Roland Ward in London, uh, Charles Kirk in Glasgow. Uh, and these were sort of pretty much off the off the catalog type purchases. So breaking down that uh, the number there, you can see we've got you know, a small number of mammals and birds, a few reptiles, amphibians, uh, quite a few insects and mollusks. Um, but overall, 
um, I'd say that only the mammals and birds are well catalogued. We've still got quite a few reptiles in jars that haven't been identified and haven't been added into the database, uh, and many, many more insects and mollusks to go. Uh, I'm talking hundreds, if potentially not thousands, um, of specimens from Africa that we're still waiting to add into our database. Uh, but of the ones that have been added in, uh, this is just to show the sort of the geographic range of where they came from. Uh, over th about 34 countries um, are listed. Uh, the majority of specimens from South Africa, um, a few from Sierra Leone. Many of those are uh, William Hunter's insect specimens. Uh, Mauritius is largely the uh, William Hunter's mollusk specimens. Kenya, there's a lot of uh, mounted um, trophy uh, mammal skulls, mammal horns and antlers um, from Kenya, and Tanzania is a bit of a mix as well. And then of the, the rest of the countries, it's sort of a handful, sometimes even just one or two specimens. So the next step uh, is obviously just cataloging more, um, get more of our records out of the drawers and out of cupboards and actually onto databases and researching more of the ones that we already know about. I, and I'd love to see sort of a, a joint project develop. Uh, some of you may be familiar with an, uh, a current project in Scotland run by National Museums of Scotland and partnering with other institutions up here uh, called Reveal and Connect, which is very much looking at the uh, African and Caribbean um, cultural objects, uh, artistic objects, um, world cultures, specimens and so on, uh, and cataloging what is where. Uh, and I'd love to see a project like that develop for the natural history specimens that we have here, uh, if not just for Scotland, but for the UK as a whole. Uh, then swiftly moving on to the data sharing aspect, you know, once we have all these specimens catalogued um, and uh, available in our database, I, to make them accessible to, to people, to researchers, to students, to anyone who's interested, um, you know, one option is for anyone to come and search our museum database. But that's kind of a, a long, awkward way of going, trying to find all this information. Uh, you'd have to know, for example, that the Hunterian exists to begin with. Then you'd have to know how to access our database. Um, so what I'd tend towards more is sharing that information on GBIF. Um, Rebecca mentioned GBIF briefly in her talk earlier. Uh, for those who don't know, this is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Uh, as it says there, this is a screenshot of their front page of free and open access to biodiversity data. At the moment, there's over 2 billion records uh, have been shared by almost 2,000 institutions around the world. I, and this is basically just bi biological information. It can be for observations, as uh, so it's some, someone bird watching and adding something, but it's also used for preserved specimens. So I had a look uh, on GBIF to see just how many preserved specimens, i.e. specimens that are held in museums, um, are currently listed for Africa. And there are 6 million records. And you can see there that there's quite a concentration in South Africa, uh, in sort of East Africa, Kenya area, um, Madagascar as well, uh, and along the, the West Coast. Um, and that sounds quite good until you compare it with what is also on GBIF for other continents, 38 million for North America, 28 for Europe, and so on. So you can see that Africa has the least number of preserved specimen records currently listed on GBIF. Uh, and considering that it's the second largest continent, and also one with some of the highest biodiversity, uh, this is a, an obvious um, problem and a failure uh, to, to share those records. So just to break down the 6 million records uh, of them, about half of them, 3 million are plants, um, and about 3 million are animals. I, I'll focus on the animal ones because I'm a zoologist, I know more about them. Um, so many of those are insect specimens, uh, almost uh, three-fifths, and then the, the chordates, including um, mammals, birds, and reptiles, and fish. Uh, makes up a, a smaller section. And these records come from, some of them actually come from African institutions, in particular South Africa. There's a the majority of the botanical specimens, for example, uh, but many um, come from institutions in the USA and Europe uh, and various other places around the world that have acquired African specimens. But fortunately, uh, GBIF uh, runs a very good program called the Biodiversity Information for Development Program, uh, which is uh, funded to help countries uh, upload and share their own records. Uh, and this is uh, an ongoing program. This one that just funding got awarded last year uh, to several institutions throughout Africa. And so hopefully this will start to uh, redress the imbalance of, of records being shared. So really the next steps for this for data sharing is to sort of prioritize the sharing of 
African specimen records from non-African institutions. So, you know, any museums or collections in the UK, I, you know, should really be, I would say, focusing on sharing their African records. I, and also encourage partnerships with um, museums and universities and institutes in Africa itself uh, to make them more aware of what we have here I, and to, you know, open up. So that's sort of the background bit that quite a few other people have covered, covered on. I next wanted to move on to this repatriation project uh, that I'm working on. As has already been mentioned, uh, the majority of natural history museum repatriations that have already happened have been involving the remains of people once known. Um, but what about animal specimens? You know, there's sort of, I, again, there's not as much priority. There's not as many cases of it having happened yet. Uh, so I just want to return a uh, talk to you about this project called Return of the Galley Wasp. So first off, what are galley wasps? Uh, they're small burrowing skink like lizards I found in the Americas and the Caribbean uh, in the family Diploglossidae. And I'm particularly interested in focusing on the endemic Jamaican genus Celestus. Unfortunately, most of them are endangered, critically, critically endangered or extinct, um, according to IUC, IUCN Red List. I, the reason for this is they're, they're quite under threat. They are one of the many victims of plantation economy. Um, back when Jamaica was ravaged and much of the land turned into sugarcane uh, plantations, uh, they had a, a big problem with introduced rats um, eating the sugarcane. One solution proposed was to bring in uh, predators such as the Indian mongoose, which did actually quite a successful job of um, combating the rats, but then also moved on to feeding on the, lake, the local native uh, endemic birds, reptiles, and so on. Um, so many of the species of galley wasp actually disappeared in the 1800s, uh, and the other ones are still just holding on now. Unfortunately, they've also got uh, another threat, an ongoing threat to the victims of folklore. Uh, in Jamaica, there's much uh, superstition around the galley wasp. Uh, one of the, the superstitions being if a, a galley wasp bites you and gets to watch before you, you do, you can die. And unfortunately, this leads to people un attacking, killing galley wasps whenever they see them, as you can see from the rather gruesome picture there. Apologies if that uh, upsets anyone. So focusing on why I got interested in galley wasps, we have uh, a specimen of the Jamaican giant galley wasp, Celestis ocidus, in the Hunterian collection. It's a large adult lizard. Uh, there's a little bit of damage to the head, you can just see there. I, and it came into the collection via the Andersonian College, um, so, so pre-1888. Unfortunately, there's not much specific information about where it came from, who collected it, apart from we know it came from Jamaica. And the reason that uh, this started to get my attention was um, our curating discomfort project, which some of you may be aware of, I, this was a project looking at reinterpreting um, objects in the collection and changing our displays. Uh, and as one of the subject curators, I was asked to come up with a short list um, of possible objects for the community curators to work through. And so I picked a range of specimens from around the world, from different taxonomic taxonomic groups, and they included this lizard from Jamaica. I, and it was it garnered quite a bit of interest. Um, one of the uh, community curators, Churnjeet Man, I uh, picked it and used it to tell the story of the plantation economy, introduced species and so on, and extinction. And then I thought, well, what's the point in uh, taking the specimen when the display finishes and putting it back in the shelf where it's been for the past, who knows, 100 years or so? Um, so I thought this would be a very good candidate for repatriation. Reasons being that it's, it's an endemic species. It's only found in, in Jamaica or was only found there critically endangered or extinct, more than likely that it is extinct, but there's slight hope that it could be holding on in some spots. But it's also a natural heritage icon for the island. It's a, a large a large specimen, large species, not many people are actually aware of it, but it's something that could really be used to help tell the story of, of Jamaica's natural heritage. But the main reason for repatriation is that there are no specimens currently in Jamaica. I have so far from a, a look on GBIF and other sources found five in Scotland, 16 in the rest of Europe uh, and 12 in the USA, but none in Jamaica. So what I did was get in touch with the University of the West Indies. I, as mentioned, I used to work um, for UE Mike, in Trinidad. Mike, you're running over time. Running over time. Okay, sorry, I'll be quick to finish up. Um, so we contacted UE, asked if they wanted it back. Shani Roper, the curator there was very keen. Dwight Robinson, the head of life sciences, was very keen as well. They got in touch with the Institute of Jamaica. Uh, they've wanted a galley wasp for years. And so we're in the process of uh, getting, working through how to return it. We want to do some DNA sampling here, um, as requested by 
people in uh, Jamaica, do some scanning, deaccession, return it. Uh, then we want to use this as a springboard to do more things, to provide training uh, and placements for students, uh, to discuss displays and education programs. Dwight was particularly interested in using it to try and highlight the importance of gallow asps uh, and to get people to think about them more favorably, but also the many historical and artistic projects that could come out of it. Uh, so lots to be done there. I um, just want to highlight as well, I'm speaking in an upcoming conference in May next year, uh, running a symposium called Return of the Specimens, Repatriation of Natural History Objects. Uh, and if anyone would like to think of um, talks to join the symposium, please do get in touch. Sorry for overrunning, uh, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for that interesting uh, presentation. I'll move on quickly to our third speaker uh, for the session, uh, who's going to be John. Uh, so John works for the Natural History Museum in London, uh, and he specializes on policy and communications with a major focus on collections and research. He is responsible for advocacy and communication for, and for policy analysis at the Natural History Museum in London, contributing and engaging across a range of cultural, environmental, and scientific themes. He has worked on ethics in the museum sector for many years, including engagements on approaches to the return of specimens and objects to countries of origins. So I'll hand it over to you, John. You're going to speak for approximately 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Let me try and share my screen. Good. Does that seem to be sharing? Okay. Yes, it's fine. Fine. Okay. Can so, see your thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about contemporary collection and collaboration um, and to give some examples of those. But just to put that into context, one of the interesting challenges for us as museums with natural history collections is that we are often looking at collections in, in two different ways. Uh, these are not incompatible, uh, but the way that we talk about different aspects of restitution and the way in which collections develop will differ according to which frame of reference we're using. So first of all, there's collection as cultural heritage, and we've been talking about that quite a lot today. Um, but there have been um, some references, and Solomon in particular mentioned um, the way in which collections function as biological resources. And clearly, um, the, the objects that we have in natural history collections are um, governed by national and local law and regulation, both in the country of origin and in the UK to, to, to varying degrees. But there is also international um, regulation, law um, and standards, which operate at the moment under the Convention on Biological Diversity. And what this means is that our approach to how collections are developed, how they're shared, how they're accessed, and what they're used for has been developing progressively over the last 40 years um, and is, is now pretty much a standard um, internationally. It continues to develop. And there are some uh, parts of the world where it's a bit um, less firmly embedded, so particularly in the States. However, Convention on Biological Diversity is about preservation and understanding of biodiversity, uh, but it's also about sovereignty, so national sovereignty of genetic resources, and that includes uh, that in collection. So um, we also have the Nagoya Protocol to the Convention, which is about access and benefit sharing of genetic resources. It's about putting in place prior informed consent when materials are collected in particular countries and having mutually agreed terms. And there are UK standards and reporting and a code of practice. And any museum that is um, acquiring new biological material will be subject to those um, in the UK. However, that only kicked in in 1992. And so uh, the law and the regulations and the way in which particular countries apply it is only for collections which were accumulated or developed after that point. Before that, however, um, it's probably the case that many um, museums with active collection uh, will apply the principles and obligations to varying degrees to the collections which were collected pre-1992. There are some areas where there's active development, where it's hard, where there is disagreement and a need for consensus. Digital sequence information. So uh, we, we know that DNA 
um, once you take it out of an organism, once you take it out of a, a living thing, um, it can be transferred, transformed into data. And what you do with that, who uses it? So there are tensions between the need for national sovereignty and open science, which are not fully resolved. Um, and there are a couple of other things there which I won't go into in any detail. So um, just to look at how we are acting, uh, actively collaborating in, um, in Africa. And so what I did was a very crude approximation. Uh, and what I'm looking at here is publications which mention uh, collaborators in the African continent. And you can see that you have a gradually diminishing uh, level of activity. So the numbers on the right hand side are the numbers of papers. And these are peer reviewed publications so not local publications. Uh, and not informal or grey literature, which there will be as well. But you can see that the a vast majority are with South Africa, and that represents both collections, presence and capacity. And then you have, uh, as I said, a gradually uh, diminishing number with an, an, a quite a wide variety of countries doing very different sorts of projects in some cases. And I'll tell you something about some of those now. So this one um, is with Zimbabwe. And it involves collaborators from South Africa and the US, as well as the museum. Um, this is a fighter saw. These are the teeth of the fighter saw. So this is 200 million years old um, from Zimbabwe. It's a what, what would have been something like plant-eating crocodile. And so a lot of interest in terms of the evolution and diversity of reptiles at the time. Um, and just to say that the, the specimens here are in Zimbabwe. So those are there in the in with, with the museums there. Um, and it's a, a sort of a fairly standard model of collaboration. I can't go into all the projects. You can see there's a huge amount that we do. Um, but just to give you an idea of how um, collaboration works and where the specimens are and who accesses the collections. So the second one I was going to talk about is a really quite a big area of activity. Uh, and this is disease. So we collect very actively uh, for disease causing organisms. In this case, it's uh, schistosome, so Bill Hartzia. And you can see my colleague Bonnie Webster there uh, with a collaborator collecting from a rice paddy. Um, and she's also there looking at um, abattoir. So these are um, parasitic organisms that live inside you. They're flukes. Um, and they affect around, I'm just looking for the number here, about 200 million people around the world, not just in Africa, but in many countries. And you have an intermediate host, which is that snail, which is Bolinus. Um, normally. So what we're doing is developing collections, and you can see the little um, pink circles um, there, uh, that is dry DNA um, uh, resource. So you have a, a number of different sorts of collections, um, which are being used by public health programs to understand the way in which these organisms evolve, um, to what the way that they react to uh, drug treatment, but also uh, giving reliable resources and collaborative um, sort of uh, collaborative resources that allow uh, public health authorities to 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 use um, this information to improve people's lives. The other one is a, a large program uh, which is a mass drug administration, and this is intestinal worms. So there's no intermediate host. These are roundworms, whipworms, uh, hookworms, so nematodes. And we've worked in Africa. So India was also involved, but this was with uh, Malawi. Uh, and with Benin, so one Anglophone, one Francophone. And again, this is about developing collections. Um, the schistosomes that I mentioned before, uh, those collections are both in country and in the UK. Uh, these collections, and you've got dealing with a wide range of materials, so it's um, so, some fecal, um, but also the, um, the, the, the worms themselves. And so those are all held in country. So the collaboration is very much about expertise and data, but it's also about the the, the diagnostic side. And so collections are crucial to this because you can go so far uh, with DNA, but you also need to be able to identify the organisms accurately. So here it's about collecting and uh, capacity building um, with collections to enable people again to improve health outcomes um, for quite large numbers of people. So again, with this one, I think we're talking about 1.5 billion people in the world have their lives uh, adversely affected by these, these uh, worms. So more conventional stuff, um, and these are frogs, um, for those who, who haven't seen them before. And this is, again, about a survey. So somebody from the Natural History Museum and um, collaborators from South, South Africa working in Mozambique. Um, the expertise comes from those two countries. 
Uh, the collections were shared between Mozambique, uh, Port Elizabeth Museum in South Africa, and the Natural History Museum. So you have duplicate collections, um, which are shared, and the, the, uh, the resource, the outcome of this is used uh, in conservation decision making. Um, something a bit different, we're talking about mineralogy here, and again, this is in South Africa. Uh, mining companies uh, are interested in how um, minerals are distributed in the Earth's crust in order to maximize um, the chance of getting uh, a profitable outcome. And this is a, a societal interest, as you, as you, as you know, um, but it's also about minimizing environmental impact. Um, nobody's quite got that right yet, but uh, we continue to, to try to help uh, understanding of where things are and what, what these different minerals are. So the minerals were extracted in South Africa. The main uh, mineral samples are in South Africa, but thin sections. So a very small part uh, was sent here for destructive sampling and analysis. Um, solanum, and we're talking about spiny solanums here. So solanum is all over the world, but this one is in, in Africa. So this was a project which was looking at the diversity of um, these species in Africa across a, a wide range of countries. Most of the fieldwork was being done in Tanzania and Kenya. So new collections were being formed. And in this case, again, um, because with plants you can do duplicate specimens, um, the key reference specimens, the holotypes, were left um, with collaborators in, in, in Kenya, in Nairobi, um, but duplicates were passed to uh, the Natural History Museum um, and to Kew in some cases. So again, large collections um, in, in Europe, but again, the, the, what that enables us to do is then to collaborate on an ongoing basis. And data were a key part of this. So you can see our NHM data portal there um, with a data set and a DOI if anybody wants to access that. Um, so this is open data that allows people to understand uh, where those plants are, are and how, how diversity is distributed. Um, it, it, it's, we, uh, sort of the, this is increasingly a part of the way that we work, so it's not just about where the specimens are, but it's how the data are accessed. Um, the specimens do move around the world, um, so we have at any one time about 300,000 uh, items on loan. The number in Africa is relatively small. Um, and why that is, um, we, we can perhaps discuss in more detail, um, but, it, but those are, are available for different uses. Um, data portal and um, Mike mentioned GBIF. So this is our, the, what part of the way in which we feed things into GBIF. And this is a search for Africa, which I did just now. And so you can see we've got about out of our 80 million or so specimens, um, we have about 5.3 million have so far been databased, and so 580 of those uh, which have been databased are from Africa. And so those are available um, for public access and use. Uh, exactly what the data consists of is different for different types of specimen. Um, and looking forwards, um, I thought it'd be useful. We don't, we're not an active participant in this program, but the future um, is increasingly around molecules. And so the African Biogenome Project is part of a much bigger consortium of global um, biogenome projects. So there's one for the UK, um, there are others for the Uni United States and for Europe and so forth. Um, this is being led by Africans. The thing about DNA is you need collections to make sense of the DNA. So there will be increasing demand for uh, an integration of data and collections and access to collections in order to make those DNA data and the way in which they used reliable going forwards but we look forward very much to to working on those sorts of uh, collaborations in the future and i think i've finished thank you thank you very much john thank you uh, such an exciting uh, presentation so we'll move on to to victoria who's going to be our last speaker for this session before we go for a roundtable discussion with all the other speakers and for question and answer so Victoria is a cultural historian and a senior curator of Choma Museum and Crafts in Zambia. She has worked for the National Museums Board of Zambia for more than 20 years as a researcher and a director. She specializes in Zambian culture and has done extensive food research across the country, the findings of which have contributed to both permanent and temporary exhibitions at the National Museums of Zambia. She's also uh, a cultural consultant for Women's History Museum in Zambia, a member of ICOM, the International Council of Museums, and has served as an African regional representative for the International Committee of Education and Cultural Action, SICA. 
She's also a board member of the African Museum and Heritage Institution, AfriHare, an organization that look at the protection, preservation, and restitution of artifacts and heritage in the whole of Africa. Welcome, Victoria, and the floor is over to you. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Am I? Um, it says hold uh, disable that and screen sharing. So how do I do this? Uh, Janice, oh, can you enable? Well, Co-host now, so you should be able to do it. Oh, okay. So I can do it now. Yeah, she's enabled you. Yeah. Okay. Um, am I sharing? No. Yes, we can see you, but I'm seeing myself on the screen. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, so I don't know what's happening to that. Um, no. Are you actually able to see your files rather than the desktop screen? That's why I am not, um, I'm not seeing my files and I'm wondering why. Um. Okay, I've removed it. Um, I'm still seeing the, the, the screen. The yeah, I'm not seeing my desktop. Is there something I'm not doing right? I think you must speak from your files, right? From your computer files, the presentation. Because my presentation is on my on on my um, desktop right now, mm -hmm. and I've gone to sharing, and I'm expecting to see. Okay, let me. Yeah. Okay, it has come. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Am okay. I sharing? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Victoria. Yeah. Um, um, uh, that's my um, uh, topic today is the broken human and the creation of the digital repatriation project uh, in Zambia. Um, the background of uh, my presentation comes from the uh, the infamous uh, Broken Hillman, which was discovered in Zambia in 1921, which is considered as one of the best preserved huminine fossils found in Africa. And this is important to Zambia because it's the first historically significant human fossil found in Africa. And uh, it provides important clues in the evolution of mankind. And uh, it was donated to the British Museum then, and now I think it's the Natural History Museum. Uh, for study. And uh, uh, this uh, background gives us uh, the restitution uh, project that uh, has come up, uh, which I am currently working on and which I'm going to talk about and uh, to talk about the restitution problems and uh, repatriation problems that uh, certain artifacts that are in European museums have found um, very difficult to take back to their countries of origin. And uh, the broken human gives a very uh, good example for Zambia's case. Um, when the broken human was taken, uh, donated to Britain in 1921, uh, Zambia didn't have anything to go by to talk about this um, great discovery. And uh, when museums were eventually set up in the country, what Zambia was given was a replica of the um, of skull while the, the original skull remained in, um, in, uh, in Britain. And uh, for Kawe, um, the place where the Broken Hill man was found, and I must state here that uh, Broken Hill is the name of Kawe, 
uh, before it changed to Kawe. So it's the broken human because of the place where it was found. And some people call it Kawe man because this is the new name for the town in which it was found. And for Zambia, I think it was hopeful that Kawe will become a center of study of uh, human evolution that this uh, skull represented. But uh, what we have now is just a monument that commemorates where this um, great discovery was found. And uh, Zambians have desired for the return of, of, this, of the skull to its country of origin because it's iconic for Zambia, but also uh, Zambia needed to be uh, the center of research for the study of the evolution of man and not Britain where uh, this skull was taken. And uh, it has been demonstrated several times by the Zambian people, the Zambian government, just to show how important um, this um, uh, skull is to Zambia by putting it on national emblems, on uh, very important uh, places. And I'm just showing this uh, postage stamp of 1995, which bore the head of the broken uh, human. Um, even if Zambia has been arguing, um, wanting to have the- Sorry, yes, sorry. we, we yes. can't see your slides. They're not moving. We're only on your first slide, your introduction. Really? Slide. Yeah. Oh my God, what's wrong with my slides? Um, and I'm new. Okay. Um, even now you can't see? To start not put in presentation mode. Okay, let me just um, let me just see if somebody can help me from here. Michael. Okay, I've asked for somebody to come and help me because um, I don't yeah, understand. A little box on your on your bottom um, because it's right side presentation mode to start that they can't move. I'm just on the same okay space. Mm. Are they moving now? No. No. Okay, let's do it again. Okay. You go. No? Okay, you go back. Yeah. Okay, okay. I can. Let's, sorry, let's come back. Yeah. And then, no? Oh. Okay. okay. Try this again. Yeah, is it moving? Yeah. Fine, fine. They are now moving. Yes, yes. Okay, so now which one do I place? Yeah. Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, so that's, um, I was talking about the, the stamp. Then, of course, the, I'm on the argument. And um, yeah, since the 1970s, Zambia has called for the repatriation of the skull. But, um, and the argument has been that when the skull was first taken out from Zambia, there were laws uh, in Zambia, the 1911 Bushman's relics laws, which forbade anyone to take any relics out of the country. But the company that donated the, the skull broke this law and went ahead and took it out without permit. And uh, in 1963, the British um, law, there was a British law that allowed British museums to, 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 to keep what they, they had collected. Uh, in 2018, uh, the government of Zambia revived this discussion again, and they went to UNESCO. And um, uh, during that UNESCO meeting, the British government denied its desire to keep the broken human in Britain. And they argued that it's the, Brit the, the Natural History Museum that is keeping it and not uh, the British um, government. And because of that, uh, that's 19, 2018, up to now, the skull is not in Zambia and there are bilateral talks. And um, yeah, this experience has made Zambians to ask, will broken human ever return to Zambia? or indeed any artifacts that are held in different European museums, um, are European governments truly committed to the issue of repatriation or do they only give back what they want to and not what the countries of origin want? So there've been many questions. 
And um, because of that, uh, the experiences of the broken human repatriation story has taught Zambians um, a big lesson that you know you cannot trust bilateral talks, you cannot trust governments. Um, UNESCO seems to be a, a body that everybody believes would actually uh, come in and be very decisive about ma such matters, but Zambians have been disappointed. And um, they've reacted in different ways. And one of the ways was uh, the digital repatriation and restitution project by the Women's History Museum in Zambia, uh, in collaboration with the Museum of World Culture in Sweden that has a number of Zambian uh, objects and the Choma Museum and Craft Center. And um, the purpose of this digital repatriation and restitution is away from the broken human because uh, that is in the hands of government now, but uh, to look at other objects that are lying around in, 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 in uh, especially European museums. So the purpose of the digital repatriation was to build up the desire for reclaiming of artifacts by local people and not to be spe spearheaded by government, to take advantage of technology such as, such as the digital platforms and uh, create um, digital connections because we cannot wait um, because waiting has been painfully uh, long for the case of the broken human and also to make use of the objects that are in um, uh, European museums while we wait, to make use of their information, discussions, and knowledge share sharing. And also to take a lead and apply research methods that work for us and not what works for Europe only. And um, for us, the provenance research has been very vital, community involvement, object identification and ownership. And this approach is where we have the re repatriation that involves uh, the community in claiming ownership and also in uh, giving information. Uh, unlike in the Broken Hillman um, case where even the African miners who were present during the discovery are not known, uh, while well, credit is giving, given to a Swiss um, European miner who was present. So we want to give power back to the community uh, where the ob objects come from. Um, we also want um, to, to involve uh, the community to, um, to own and drive uh, the objects. They should be the ones to select what should come and what shouldn't if they don't need it and what they really feel they need. Um, we also want to add the voices of the owners of the project, uh, uh, the owners of the objects. Uh, we uh, like in this case where the people after identifying the objects, they are describing what the objects really are from their point of view. And most importantly, we want to, 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 to encourage the naming of objects. And I'm just giving an example here of this, um, uh, armband, which is in the collection of the Swedish Museum. It's described uh, as an armband, very uh, short description, but when given to the owners, they gave different parts of, the, of this armband a name. And uh, we are on that, um, in this pro project, uh, trying to encourage the naming and the correct naming from the um, point of view of the communities. Then we also want to ask uh, to, to deal with the issue of context because um, dealing with um, objects that have moved to other places, there've been uh, issues of context in terms of what is it, where does it belong to, you know, strict lines between natural history, um, cultural history, uh, human remains. Uh, we want a holistic approach. For instance, this Python skin, where does it belong to? Is it a natural history collection? Is it a cultural um, history collection? The tortoise shell, uh, where do you classify it? How do you get the information? We want a kind of approach that is holistic um, as understood by the communities and not as uh, put in, small, in boxes by um, different uh, world views. This, uh, the context of this smoking pipe, as I said, where uh, do you draw the lines? The animal skin, uh, where do you draw the lines? Um, we, are also, we also want to make use of the, 
um, the collections that are in, in European uh, museums that it, if we get them, we want them to be useful. We don't want them to be in storerooms and closed up or just for staring at. We want them to make um, meaningful uh, contribution to today's lives. Uh, for instance, we had this project, Fabricated Stories, where we used the, the different collections in, this, uh, in, the, in the Swedish Museum for artists to get inspirations to do different things with them. We had musicians that made music from the uh, inspirations from the objects. We had fashion um, people that uh, produced uh, fabric colors inspired by the, um, the collections. We had uh, powerful photography uh, generated by, uh, by the inspiration from the, from the objects. Then uh, we, we also, in conclusion, uh, we want to make use of the objects in things that are troubling us, like climate change studies. Um, for instance, we, we've looked at the use of natural dyes, um, how, how good, how bad they can be, or how they can affect, affect the in environment. The varieties of animal species that existed then and that existed now, actually, you can tell uh, from the collection what is dwindling and what is still in abundance, the adaptation uh, of communities to environmental changes by study, studying the material used in the making of tools then and now. So um, in a nutshell, that's what we are doing as um, Women History Museum in collaboration with Choma Museum and the Swedish Museum of Wild Culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, for the presentation uh, and thank you very much to the old presenters but can I bring you back onto the screen the four of you we're going to have a roundtable discussion where I'm going to open up questions from the floor and then we can have somewhat a discussion around some of the major issues that arose from from this interesting panel on uh, restitution repatriation of natural history collections collaborative approaches to data sharing and knowledge uh, in museums. So uh, I'm going to throw the first question to, to all of you as the chair of the session, uh, which, thing is, which I think is very important from, from what I've been reading. <laughs> so this idea of collaborations, right, and democratizing knowledge production within museum spaces and collections, it seems as if it's a very important decolonial strategy. But my question to all of you, as curators, as researchers, what does the power sits within these kind of collaborations? Who has the power to determine and decide what goes back as form of repatriation or restitution? And what is the role of these so-called communities? The word community to me is quite problematic in a whole lot of ways, because who are these communities? Thinking about communities as very heterogeneous, right? They're not similar. There are different communities within communities, even in Africa. So how do we think of collaborations, as we all think that collaborations are a form of decolonizing our collections. Yes, it is, but what are some of the delimits or the delimitations of using collaborations as a form of decolonial methodology? That's my first question. Can I start off? Just yeah, by... yeah, anyone amongst you, you can. Yeah. You can. Um, so I, I would say that it's, there's still a significant imbalance where you look at the the fundamental the the sort of the, the foundational resources of our understanding of the natural world that still lies in large institutions like ours so it's very much that um this this sort of way of understanding the world started in europe um and it's it's gradually developed into institutions that are spread that are in different countries but you still have that sort of the early phases and the foundational resource. And so with various sorts of conversation and um, new resources such as digitization, we can share that, but it doesn't mean to say that the power has shifted entirely. I would say that with some of the things that I pointed to, um, the demand um, to know about the natural world and to be able to engage with it comes from countries of origin. And so biodiversity and health are good examples where governments impose um, requirements on themselves, but also their international agreements that they work in certain ways. They want to improve the lives of their people. They need the knowledge. 
And there, a part of that must be capacity building. So it's partly about making knowledge available, but it's also about empowering people to develop knowledge to their own ends. Thank you very much, Chuck. So I think that's a very interesting response. I mean, thinking about empowering communities and also thinking about their own ways of knowing and doing, which perhaps as museum practitioners, we've been excluding for a very long time, right? The indigenous ontologies and how they can also form part of this conversation ar around repatriation and restitution away from the dictates of curatorial authority and curatorial knowledge. Uh, Victoria, you want to come in for this one? Yes, I want. Yeah, I wanted to come in and um, agree with John that actually the power of um, uh, the the power plays in the in the talk of um, uh, repatriation uh, lies in a small clique of people and uh, certain governments and um, uh, the, the the people from which these uh, objects come from know nothing about this repatriation. The arguments are all very political. Even the purpose of repatriation in most cases is very political. But mm -hmm. uh, sadly, it's the, the, the knowledge sharing, which is um, also a very political um, um, uh, scenario because knowledge now is packaged, bound by particular groups of people and owned by those people. And even the ways of knowing uh, are, are not all acceptable. And uh, it's, a, it's a shock how we exclude people and uh, especially museums, they are very powerful uh, spaces. I always want to share one um, experience that I've had having worked in museums for such a long time that uh, we, we, we've been exhibiting this grinding stone for a long time. In, I mean, in most museums, you find it telling a story of food production and as a kitchen utensil. It was not until we did this repatriation project uh, uh, when we went to uh, uh, the people where some of these objects come from. And they were telling us what uh, the objects were. And when we came to the grinding stone, which I always thought I knew, they said, oh, it's also a, a funeral, um, a, a, a funeral um, rite um, uh, object. And it was my first time learning that. And I asked them why they didn't tell us in the museums to say we should also include it on the funeral rites um, uh, objects. Then they said, oh, why should we tell you you didn't ask? You know, do we ask them? I think we don't, and yeah. we keep uh, making mistakes, and uh, and and uh, they, they just stand by and look at us because they're so respect for that. They would just not pump answers into us. Meanwhile, we think we know when we don't, and mm -hmm. we don't ask. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's the question I would want to to pose to everyone: Do we yeah. ask? Yeah. No. No, I think it's also a respect of different forms of knowing and knowledge that we as practitioners, we need to embrace as we think about decolonization and increasingly so from what you're rightly saying, we all think about decolonization from this kind of epistemological point of view as experts, right? But the empirical practice of it, how do we do it in a practical way, allowing communities to take power and also have their voices taking center stage in these conversations? I'll give Mike a chance to respond as well. Yeah, just uh, adding into um, you know, previous comments, and the a repatriation project I'm developing right now with uh, people in Jamaica, um, obviously to get that first in, it wasn't really a community level one, but more it was institution to institution, university to university, um, and I the yeah the, the power balance thing. I think all I was. I, Trying to be very open at the beginning, and it's all I wanted to do was um, return this this galliwas without any um, you know I, res restrictions or anything. It was just about getting this back, and then using that to hopefully lead to more community involvement, to more um, historical connections going on, to more I like you said training and uh, capacity building. Um, one thing that the Institute of Jamaica mentioned was. Um, you know, more uh, experience and more training for things like specimen preservation, um, you know, sk preparing skins, preparing wet specimens and so on. And so that's one bit that's come up. But that, the bit that I really liked was the potential of using this lizard as um, something iconic to try and work with communities and people in Jamaica, led by um, University of the West Indies, 
to mm -hmm. you know, highlight these lizards and highlight how they're not a, a dangerous thing, how, highlight how they're an important part of the ecosystem there, and they've been lost through the you know the decades, through the centuries. Um, as that that was really intriguing, um, and I'd love to see that develop probably over most of the other sort of aspects. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot there, but it's it helps having a university to university connection, and then the university in the, the you know the, the country we're connecting with. They have more connections um locally and they can make the i uh, the calls so you know it's it's finding that in sometimes is quite hard i uh, in repatriation efforts mm -hmm. thank you solomon do you want to, to to quickly respond i have a specific question for you solomon in terms of the african museum you spoke about little is known about this collection and then you did, did survey about african collections and how many people understand the idea of a museum in africa and and that's a very interesting question as well to pose because the history of a museum in Africa is also deeply tied to the colonial process, right? Because most of these African countries are former colonies and museums, they, they also ought to be decolonized because they're still suffering from colonial fatigue. Besides just talking about restitution of objects from Europe to Africa, what are African museums also doing in terms of decolonizing themselves in view of their colonial spaces and their colonial creation? Right, as colonial products of mm -hmm. colonization. That's just a follow-up question to, to, to a, I mean, you said it all. I even wonder what I have to add now, but uh, that's the question that I, um, I've always asked myself. You know, I completely understand from this point of view, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living in Germany now and I work with projects uh, around Europe, but I'm also working with several collections in Africa. So I see it from both sides, you know, and, and the, this is the question. There are colonial legacies too in African collections. And you can see how exhibitions were set up and everything you know, is managed. It's rooted within the colonial uh, uh, histories. You know? And, and, and uh, 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 just a little bit to derail a bit and go back to uh, what uh, Mike also kind of commented about on, you know, when we talk about restitution, my, question is always, you know, I always hear, you know, communities and communities. And I'm always like, do you go to a certain community and say, this artifact was got from around this area and we give it to the leader, the, you know, there must be institutions somehow, you know, because this debate, uh, uh, we are talking about museums and somehow you, 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 you have to find an institution, whether a university, or a museum or something like this to work with. And then there is another question you just uh, uh, raised and are communities, how do they see these institutions? That becomes a second question, you know? Do they think about museums the way, you know, museums for instance, want uh, uh, to be thought about? And this partly was a question that I actually also asked and I did a survey and I have over uh, 200 uh, responses. And I was also, yes, surprised that people don't know. Yeah. They, they haven't been to museums. They don't even care for many of these uh, things. And I asked questions to people who are living very close to museums mm -hmm. and some are like, I've never even gone to that museum. So for me, I look at it in both ways. So if we are talking about, you know, before we even talk about repatriation, what do we have in Africa? How is it faring? You know, how are the people responding to all these things? I always give this example that one day, one day, you know what, just five years, there will, we will have something taken back to Africa. It will make some news. And five years later, we shall have another, you know, kind of blow up of, you know, look at what we took back to Africa and look how it's faring now, you know. It, it is, you know, these are the things that are going to come up. And so for me, looking at it from, both angles, I always ask, you know, as we talk about decolonizing, what is the state of affairs in Africa? Yeah. How are collections? What, and, and they, are we just exchanging legacies from, you know, Europe to Africa to be housed in Africa? Or are we really doing something genuinely, you know, uh, important? So, yeah. No, thank you very much. Powerful reflections, powerful. Victoria, before I open this to the floor, because it's a question and answer segment as well. I was just trying to start a conversation. Victoria? Yes, I just wanted to say that, you know, 
the, 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 the decolonizing process is also just uh, so difficult uh, to even to talk about, even to break down. But maybe what we should say is that there's just been exchange of power, uh, exchange of who holds uh, uh, the colonizing power. Right mm -hmm. now, uh, we can talk of Europe, but we are also talking of ourselves as representation of those colonizing institutions and museums are uh, colonizing institutions. And uh, when we talk of um, um, uh, communities, yes, it's possible to go back to the community like we did in the project. They go and identify and put their knowledge there and not our knowledge on the, on the project. And for us, our project is, it should be from the community to the, to the universities or to wherever. It should never be from the university to the community because after all, the university doesn't even know. So why should the university be that power? Because the university is just a colonized um, uh, institution as well. And also the, the issue of just collecting, collecting from the community to put in this house. Wh why, why collect and collect and collect? You know, what, what kind of this um, uh, behavior uh, and why are we even allowing it? And uh, you know, I would ask uh, 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 so many questions. Does it have to be in this building? Why not leave it where it is? And, and so what if after five years, uh, we are going to say, oh, see what we, we took back. I mean, for me, the question is not see what we took back. The question is, why are you holding on to what is mine? You know, it's like a bully uh, in, in, in class, uh, he gets your pencil, even when he doesn't need to use the pencil, he gets it for his power and say, I won't give it back to you. It's not that uh, you won't take care of it properly. You, you don't have institutions, you don't have, the question is, are you bullying me? And if, if, if you are, please stop. So it's, it's a question of respect. It's a question of ownership. It's a question of labeling. Who is putting the label on the product? Yeah. Who, yeah. yeah. So, so th those are some of the questions that I, I, I doubt if it's questions of uh, whether we have institutions. No, I doubt if it's questions whether there are communities there or, or not. No, it's a question of power and who holds power and the problem of those of us that have taken the position of the colonialists. And then now we are talking about decolonizing. We can't because we are the colonizers, the new colonizers. That's a very interesting perspective. Actually, I think about African museums as replicas of museums that you find in Europe in a whole lot of ways. I've worked in an African museum myself for quite a lot of time. And the, diff, the binary divisions between nature and culture, the classifications of objects is still the same. So I think we also need to think about colonial violence in Africa. What happened when communities lost their own objects to museums in Africa? And how do we decolonize as well? All right, there are a number of questions that are on the on the chat platform. I want to read specific questions to specific uh, speakers. There's a question for, I think it's for Victoria. Is the Kagwe men cataloged in the NHS museum? A question which, from Anthony. Which NHS museum is it natural history? Museum, natural history museum, I suppose. Where is the Kagwe men? Is it natural history museum? It's in natural history museum in Britain. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just to, speaking, speaking from the Natural History Museum, yes, it is in the Natural History Museum. So it's in, in the gallery downstairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've All never right. seen it, actually. I, I don't know. Many Zambians have never. No, it's, not, it's, it's on display. Yeah. 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 All right. And then I want to pick up from this question. Victoria spoke about the word, uh, sorry, the UNESCO Convention and how you guys try to reach out to them to facilitate the, the repatriation of the Cab women. Is the site where this hominid was discovered a world heritage site? Is it protected or is it just one of the other normal sites that you find? Is it an archaeological, paleontological site that is protected by the act and laws of Zambia? What's the status of the heritage site in the absence of that? <laughs> yeah, actually, the site was destroyed by the, by the mining company uh, during colonial time. It's, uh, it, uh, it never even existed beyond the five years after discovery, because what was important to the colonial and the miners then was the mining. So they went ahead with the mining. And even the study of the government has had some challenges because 
the site from where it was found, it's, it's, it's no longer accessible, it was destroyed. So even to do the studies, um, uh, it has been difficult because how do you get samples from a place that has been uh, uh, destroyed and even the findings, they keep changing because uh, the place was not preserved. So the, the, the monument that is in Kabo is not on the site. The site is not accessible. It's just in Kabo town. And if it was destroyed this time, I'm sure I would have been told, oh, that's why we can't give you the, 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 the scar. You know, you have destroyed the site. We didn't even destroy it. They did. They destroyed it. So it's, it doesn't exist. All right, that's that's fine. Yeah. Thanks for the clarity. And then there's a question here from an anonymous attendee. They're saying the question, there's a question here about how collaboration is mobilized as a way of legitimizing museum practice. So museums contribute to hold power over knowledge and process rather than handing over and giving over, uh, giving up of power. What does giving up and handing over power look like? I think it's almost like a repetition of what we said in the beginning. Where, where does the power geography lie in terms of the negotiations around repatriation, restitution, expect authority vis-a-vis -vis indigenous ways of doing and knowing. So who's got the power, the authority to decide and to determine these restitution, repatriation issues? Are, the, are we as curators, the ultimate voices, or we use collaborations as a tokenist kind of approach, but yet in actual fact, behind this collaboration, there are no, there are no collaborations actually, it's just a continuation of expertise and expert authority. I don't know whether anyone wants to respond to this, but I, I suspect we once spoke about the geographies of power and collaborations and how and equal the power is usually uh, formulated between the so-called communities and expert authority of curatorship. Yeah, I'm, I, I think it's this discussion. I mean, I've only really started in this area very recently, and so still a lot to learn, but it just, um, the way that my repatriation project has been developing is kind of having both parties having wish lists um, of what they want to achieve out of these things. Um, and then just discussing lots of talk, lots of um, back and forth. I, you know, be, be open, be very, um, you know, willing to I look at the different viewpoints is that giving up power just means not having demands, just having thoughts and requests. But uh, yeah, something I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's another follow-up. I think this is linked to what we are talking mm -hmm. about from the same, from the same um, uh, anonymous attendee. They're saying here, is the question of what returns to Africa or what communities know also a product of colonial theft and erasure? Museumization has also historically been a process of extraction and suppression of cultures. So the point that Samo raises about communities is also about colonial violence and what is made absent. I think it's, we're reflecting upon the African museum space as a space which is also suffering from colonial, colonial violence, colonial residue of collecting, appropriating, dislocating, and containing in museums. So these histories of museums, whether they're in Africa or in Europe, I think they share a common kind of relationship, right? the colonial project of classification, categorizing, and taking people's cultures to study. That's the same thing that you find in African museum. So the decolonial project as a knowledge production kind of project, I think it cascades just beyond the European museums. It also has to be addressed within an African contextual kind of places where African museums are still struggling very much. As what Samuel said, I think most African museums, they remain very much elitist, right? Then urban areas and communities can't even go to urban areas to see these museums. They don't even know about museums. Apart from when you're a kid, when you're going to a school visit, an educational tour, that's when perhaps you know about a museum. So there's still very much exclusionary spaces. And I think the discussion is to extend beyond just the returning of objects from Europe, but also thinking about the position of an African museum in a whole lot of ways. Can I just quickly respond on that point about power? Yeah. Um, and I think there are still fundamental very obvious inequities, um, as we've discussed. I would point to the CBD, so the Convention on Biological Diversity, and what that represents is a recognition of the rights and a shift in power. It wasn't the first step because there were earlier ones as well, but what that means is that countries, and this doesn't mean to say museums within those countries, but countries have rights and sovereignty 
with respect to biological resources, so natural science collections. So that represents a step, but it's a process, it's a long haul. The other thing I would flag uh, is traditional knowledge. And yeah. that's explicitly recognized as a really important thing. And clearly, indigenous peoples can be exploited by their, their own country, as well as internationally by former colonial powers. So there are these recognitions of the need to shift power to the people um, of a country, of the, of the locality where those objects come from. Thank you very much. Uh, the, open, the floor is still open to follow up questions from, from the audience. And I have another question here, which reads, can we think of repatriation and restitutions as a way of refusing colonial dominance? Anyone, can we think of this as repatriation, restitution as a method or a way of refusing colonial dominance, Victoria? Yes, I, I, I mean, it, for me, this is my opinion. I, I, the way I look at restitution and repatriation is not really like refusing colonial dominance per se, but uh, perhaps it's um, undoing the, uh, um, undoing what was done wrongly. And it's uh, taking back the respect, uh, uh, taking back the, the value, uh, taking back the, the position that uh, can I take up my rightful opposition, position that I am I'm the owner? Can mm -hmm. I be respected if we are going to, to share this knowledge? Can I be acknowledged? Can I be uh, a, a, a source or a place uh, of reference? Because even referencing is an issue. That's why uh, university for me is a, is a, it's a, it's also a difficult space because uh, you know, how do you even become a doctor? The, the information that I, I, I am going to get from the community makes me a doctor. Uh, and uh, the community is not a doctor. They can't qualify to be a doctor. So restitution is, should be deeper than the objects being uh, taken back. It should relook the way we look at knowledge, the way we acknowledge knowledge and uh, the way we, we position knowers. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the way we package um, and label uh, uh, the knowledge about things. So restitution for me is deeper than the object. Restitution yeah. is checking the scales and yeah. who is tipping the scales. Yeah. I think it's essentially for me, I think it's just a means to an end, not an end in itself, because there are bigger yeah. debates and conversation around museum practices, right? I'm, I know most people would think that restitution and repatriations are the typical decolonial methodology that museums are supposed to undertake. But there are many other ways of decolonizing a museum collection before we actually restitute. Some of yeah. you are speaking about provenance research, comprehensive provenance research. I'm a curator of living cultures at Manchester Museum, sitting over a collection of almost 7, 8,000 African collections, some of them very unprovenanced. To start up about thinking about decolonization, for me as a curator, it's just thinking about the provenance of these objects that are categorized Africa as a geographical region like Africa. So how do we decolonize such kinds of things before we return, right? Those collaborative provenance researches, the biographical research, are also very important aspects of decolonizing the museum practice, which will ultimately perhaps lead to restitution. So there are many ways of thinking about this question about decolonizing, retaining the institution, which has become quite a metaphor, a buzzword where people want to think yeah. about decolonization. And, but, but how do we do it? Okay, yeah. uh, I think there's another one. Uh, Solomon, you want to follow up? Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, I have to make a disclaimer. I, 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 and this disclaimer is I, I understand when people, when countries, when communities, you know, ask for stuff back. Yeah. I completely understand that and I'm not against that. I am more of the pragmatic person thinking about what is possible to do and how should it be done, you know? And so, of course, uh, we, we all understand, we all know it. We, we will talk about communities and blah, 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 but there will always be power hierarchies. Even the people that say that they will go and take them to communities, they are power hierarchies, Yeah, you know? Who are these people that are, you know, connecting with the communities that we are talking about? It doesn't matter whether we are talk, going to talk about 
museums, whether we are going to talk about universities, whether we are going to talk about NGOs. The whole point is there will be power hierarchies. Now, the, que the question becomes, you know, uh, what is the goal? What do we want? You know, I completely, you know, it makes sense to, you know, like what Victoria said that this is about ownership. It's about showing, you know, but I don't think this is undoing anything. If you send back one, two, you know, and of yours, obviously the other disclaimer is that I mostly talked about natural history collections. In this case, talking a lot about biological objects, you know, and, 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 and the like. So if we talk about returning one of the specimens, you know, undoing would mean essentially returning everything, right? So the question here, it, it's simplifying things and talking in simplicity to think that repatriation will undo everything. I think the whole important aspect here is to understand that, okay, if things were done, if there were things that were done, what, how do we move forward from here? Like you said, we have lots of colonial legacies in African collections. We still have these. They still exist, you know. They are institutions. They are in our countries. They exist, you know. And how do we start to move away from here? You know, one point, I mean, I, I still understand that, you know, if, if a museum is not working with communities at the level we are at now, it's already a problem, you know. But the question is not just, you know, sending back things and, and and doing that the question is deeper in in, in it's it's about creating the right environment uh, uh, to allow institutions it's, it's, we are here and we all understand the role of museums so we can't pretend that we can't say that museums are not important mm -hmm. you know they are important they have their place but then we have to understand that the problems that are associated are the things we need to look at there is a place for museums and the problems associated are the things we need to look at. So this, this is something that I think we need. We, we, there is no simple way. There is no thin line of, we are just going to do that and things will be fine. The thing is complex and we have to look at it in its complexity. All right, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to, we are about to break for, for, for lunch. Uh, so I have one last question for all of you. And also perhaps I want to bring in the other previous speakers for this very important question, which speaks to all the people that have been uh, presented from, from morning. So my question is around this binary division between nature here, culture here, right? Which, which museum so often used to reinforce disciplinary categories, right? There's nature on one side, there's culture on one side. So how do we, really negotiate this false binary division between what nature is and what culture is, considering that from where these objects or specimens were stolen from, they don't see this difference between nature and culture. There's an interchangeable relationship between nature and culture, right, from communities. These two things are not different, like as we box them in museums that I'm a curator of anthropology, I'm a curator of zoology. So how do we negotiate that forced binary division between nature and culture, which is reinforced by museum practices? It's a general question to almost all of you who presented during this session and the previous speakers as well. Anyone wants to try? I see Rebecca is back. <laughs> Rebecca. Um, so I don't really uh, know if I have an answer to that, but I, I believe that, um, yeah, getting rid of the false binary between nature and culture is incredibly useful to make the best use of museum material wherever it is. Um, <clears throat> for example, using it to help with conservation and climate change, um, because I think we can't, well, to my mind anyway, I think most of the big problems facing all of us in the world at the moment uh, might be a lot easier to understand and solve if we if we kind of broke down some of those false binaries um, and also opened ourselves up to other ways of thinking about the world that aren't necessarily how we used to think in the museum so not not having to restrict ourselves to kind of the western science way of thinking but also acknowledging there are other ways of um of solving problems that's my thought right anyway just quick quick reflections in 10 seconds, 20 seconds. <laughs> Victoria? Yeah, um, I, I, I would just say that, you know, it's, it's a question of uh, the worldview. 
and mm -hmm. uh, what which worldview do you allow? And mis uh, museums are quite controlling, um, are very strict, very rigid. And uh, yeah, to, to a point where you have a, a, a very narrow view of certain things. So the, the, the binary is in so many things, not only in um, culture and uh, natural history, but uh, it's, it's in a lot of things. And maybe it's uh, making the museum open up to, to other worldviews and even just uh, asking the question of, even the, the question of museum itself, uh, it's so, uh, we think about it so Eurocentric, uh, Eurocentrically, instead of thinking of it um, widely, because I know in my traditions that there are aspects of museum uh, practice, not in the way that we are thinking of the museum now, but in very different ways of how families keep uh, uh, their histories, how spaces um, retain their, their spaces uh, of their, their histories, their characteristics. It is a uh, museology in a way, but we have moved or we have been accultured to think of this four walls space where we are putting in things and um, the culture of materialism, even what we don't know, what we don't even care about, we are going to put it in there and collect it and acquire it. <laughs> and then uh, in the end, we want to control um, that. And that bring, that, that, that's what I've seen in museums. That's what museums are doing to our minds. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we can continue the conversations later. Thank you very much to the four panelists uh, for the thought provoking presentations. Uh, that we had uh, during this session. Thank you to John, thank you to Victoria, Solomon and uh, Mike. So we're going to break for approximately 15 minutes. Uh, we will convene around uh, quarter past one UK time. Then we continue our last session uh, after lunch, uh, which is going to be on the engagement in UK with a focus on Birmingham Museum. So thank you so much. See you again in approximately 15 minutes for the last uh, session on after lunch. Thank you so much.
Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to our last and final uh, session, mm, discussions for the devolving restitution uh, project program uh, number six. So we going to move on to the last and final session, session number three, which is going to be chaired by Kadian uh, Paul of the Birmingham City Museum. So I'll hand over to, to Kadian uh, to take over and do the introductions for the next speakers and as well as doing an introduction for, for yourself, a short introduction for yourself. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. I hope everyone has uh, returned and is still feeling energized, even though we know that after lunch, it can get a little difficult, but I think this should be a very interesting conversation. Uh, my name is Dr. Katie M. Powell, and I am from Birmingham City University, uh, where I lecture in sociology and black studies. And I've also had uh, the fortunate um, ability to work with uh, a partnership between the Don't Settle program put on by Beat Freaks and the partnership with the Birmingham Museums and Trusts where we work with young people aged 17 to 25, uh, young people of color in Birmingham and getting them more involved uh, in the museum world. And we tackle issues around decolonization and barriers to engagement and come up with really fun, active um, exhibitions and programming. So um, that's a bit about me. Today, I'll be chairing the engagement panel, which I think is a very important one. We've talked about history of collections. We've talked about uh, repatriation, restoration, and approaches to that. And now this panel, um, we have two speakers, is going to be about engagement, particularly in the Birmingham area. And for it, we have two speakers today, the first of whom is Rachel Minot. I hope I'm saying that correctly correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, she is a Jamaican born artist, Jamaican born like myself, curator and researcher. She is currently joint head of participation at Birmingham Museums and Trust and trustee of the Museum of Homelessness. Previously, she has been included as, uh, she has been inclusion and change manager at the National Archives chair of the Decolonizing Guidance Working Group for the Museums Association and co-author of Support Decolonization in Museums 2021, curator of anthropology with a focus on social practice at the Horniman uh, Museum and Gardens, researcher and curator of the exhibitions uh, The Past is Now, Birmingham and the British Empire, that was in 2017, and also within and without Body Image and the Self uh, 2018 with Birmingham Museums Trust. So she's got a lot that she's been engaged with. And our second speaker is quite special to me. Um, I'm just going to add in here that she's one of my former students um, before I introduce her. Joyce Treasure uh, is a multidisciplinary artist. She gained her BA uh, honors in Black Studies from Birmingham City University. Originally trained as a silversmith, she has extensive experience working within the creative industry, including prop making and photography. She received a certificate in script writing from Birkbeck University in 1988, which led to her winning a writing award where her film was made and funded by BBC and ABI. She taught film production, uh, worked also as an editor and director, and in 2012, she began to practice as a multidisciplinary artist working in layers and body forms to slice cultural and iconic imagery together using collage, print, acrylic, assemblage, and film around the topic of identity. Her current work seeks to interrogate colonial histories of trauma, resistance, and survival to analyze parallels between different sites and locations using decolonizing reasoning. She is interested in the intergenerational transmission of trauma and its physical, psychological, and social repercussions as a site of healing and well being. Uh, everyone, please welcome our speakers, Rachel Minot and Joyce Treasure. Uh, 
Rachel, I think we will begin with you if that's okay. And I just want to say very quickly that um, Joyce is not feeling the greatest today. So that is why her camera uh, remains off. Okay. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm gonna try and share my screen. Um, is that visible for everybody? It's visible for me, yes. Great, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Rachel Minot. I'm uh, one of the joint heads of participation here at Birmingham Museums Trust which is a new role within the trust. Um, and I shared this um, position with my colleague, Charlotte Holmes. And we both um, occupy other kind of other roles which will inform our practice and give us a different kind of perspective. Um, and we're leading, we're following the leadership of Sarah and Zach in this kind of co-leadership um, role, which has been really um, exciting to, to, to do. And it kind of embeds inclusion and participation and collaboration into the role, which will hopefully encourage that sort of work across the organization. So I am really honored to be a part of the today's conference. Um, the discussions have been really rich so far, and um, I'm hoping that I can um, make an addition to the, the discussion that enriches it further. But um, I am I'm mindful that what I'm about to present is going to be a much more kind of generalized um, view. So I want to explore what it means to engage um, and to do sort of participation and potentially mass participation around questions of restitution and um, to think about that within Birmingham. So um, repatriation and restitution of museum items can be a powerful cultural, spiritual and symbolic act which recognizes past wrongs and restores items to their original community. Decolonizing Decolonization requires an open, proactive, and positive approach that places justice at the center of proposals for repatriation and restitution. And this is an excerpt taken from the Decolonizing in Museums guidance um, that um, was published with Museum Association, which I had the privilege of working on with Chaudia. And I wanted to kind of put this at the foreground of this presentation because the, the understanding of repatriation and restitution in um, kind of public discourse really needs to kind of recognize the sort of the importance of the symbolic as well as the kind of practicalities that have been discussed earlier today. What I believe we've seen throughout the conference is how much delving into these collections, learning more about these collections can really enrich this discussion and really open up the avenues in which we could take um, restitution um, proposals in the future. Um, and it, it really kind of involves understanding what it is we have, cataloging it better. But there is a version of this that where the discourse remains within our institutions, where we speak to each other and other practitioners, and it becomes very difficult to communicate what we're thinking um, wider and um, how to kind of translate the detail of some of these discussions when actually for a lot of people, this is a, a symbolic discussion. It's not about necessarily the details. So in terms of um, what it is that we could do, um, and what we should be doing for restitution claims is one, responding to calls as they arise, and two, preparing for calls that we think may arise. Responding to calls requires us to be really respectful and thoughtful, make no assumptions of the project of the process of what the outcome might be, and work, but work with hope of facilitating this restitution or else some other form of reconciliation and healing. And we want to kind of make sure that this practice is informed by justice practices. So we understand the idea that evidence and testimony is important, that we um, think about multiple sides of the, the process and we kind of work through um, this kind of fulfilling um, justice as um, the kind of main intention of um, responding to restitution calls. Um, to do that though, we need to be very clear. Our communication needs to be open, our process needs to be accessible. And this is currently not the case. So this is why at the start of the day, we talked about Birmingham's next steps would be about reviewing our, um, our procedures on restitution and, and making sure that these are really clear. So people who do want to put in a call to us have a real, a, a real understanding of how long it might take, who they would need to contact, um, and that this is something we are open to and not something that is difficult or that we're trying to make purposefully 
obscure. The other side of this is preparing for calls. So we've already begun this work. This project has had some very deep impacts in terms of us understanding what it is that we have in the natural history collection, specifically around Africa. We wouldn't necessarily have had the resources to kind of explore that um, slice of our collections in this way. And so um, we're going to continue this with those collections and we're going to look further to understand what are the um, potential claims that are in our collection. We, we need to know this because our database is not overly accessible. And so it would be important that we know internally so that we can make these things better known externally. And so once we do know what our potential claims, we do some proactive engagement and conversations over the use of future collections and bringing these um, to the attention of some important people in the kind of process, such as Birmingham City Council, as soon as possible. However, the question of engagement um, and Birmingham museums is quite an interesting one. As um, said before, we um, are caretakers of a collection um, that's owned by Birmingham City Council, but in reality, it's owned um, by the people of Birmingham. And so when we think about our engagement, we're always trying to figure out how to make our collections more accessible, more useful, more relevant to the people of Birmingham. And so a lot of what we focus on tends to be on understanding um, belonging to Birmingham and then the wider world. So it always starts with this idea of kind of um, local. But that means that when we're engaging in questions of restitution, we're really engaging with the diaspora um, in that kind of perspective. And there's some very keen differences in the diaspora that we need to make sure are kind of um, raised to the surface so that we don't conflate. There's lots of language nuances, things that mean something in a particular like Birmingham diaspora context that won't mean the same thing in a, a source community. Um, there's also different languages spoken here. We do still have this very um, strong tendency to um, speak only in English and um, ignore a lot of um, other languages that might um, be necessary for us to communicate and to talk about the complexity and the nuance. Um, there are also contemporary policies and priorities of local gov governments and communities. Solomon was quite clear in this. It was quite interesting to hear about kind of being really pragmatic. There are different realities to, in different contexts. Um, and we need to not conflate this by kind of thinking about the context that is being prioritized by our government and our perspective and understand actually what might be, um, it, what should be part of the discourse when we're thinking about communities of origin. And really, again, understanding the resource implications of some of these practices. It's been really great to hear in the repatriation discussion about how we, some of the projects, especially the one um, being facilitated in Jamaica, included kind of um, testing that could only be done in the UK. That's um, a really great way of kind of understanding how we could support these processes in, in a more continued way and understanding that there are resources that we can add in that are beyond the object and the knowledge themselves. Sorry to interrupt, Rachel. Could yeah. I have um, the full screen, please, on the slides? Thank you. Um, it's showing full screen for me. I, I can see you. Rachel, if you, if you if you just select those three little dots underneath your screen, you can make it take it off of um, high presenter view for everyone. If you just quickly. And then make it full screen up at the top of your computer. The top right. Um, sorry, the the zoom. It says are... it's okay. It says present in Teams. If you look at the top, um, towards the right, there's a button that says present in Teams, or 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 on the left as well. Sorry, we're not in Teams, so we're. Oh, in... sorry. Yeah. Oh gosh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I think your window can be expanded next to the X up at the top right. Does that expand your window up there? Sorry, I can't. There's a toolbar that's stopping me seeing. Um, the little, oh, there it is. That little present, it's in that red um, bar at the very top. You might not be able to see it. <laughs> Can't present in Teams because we're not in Teams. No, 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 not that. Um, do you see where I... the say? No, the top line. 
above the menu. That right there. Sorry, it's not letting me click anything now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll have to. Sorry, Joyce, go with what we can. Stop sharing, I think. Um... I mean, you'd have to just use what's going, what, what you have at the moment, thank you. It's working now. We can see the full screen, Rachel. That's great. Thank you. Oh, okay. I I can't, but I'll I'll be I'll I'll believe that it, it's working then. Okay. Um there's also some further questions around kind of blended identities in the diaspora that complicate different um perspectives that are um really useful for discourse and engagement, but things to be mindful of whilst we um have these kind of voices in, in the space. Um and they're very benefits. So there's been in the past discussions about how um, some restitution claims should be um, considered, considering the impact on the diaspora. So for example, there were discourses around the return of the Benin bronzes and the um, impact on localized Nigerian communities who only have access to, um, who have access to their cultural property only in museums in England. And, that was an unnecessary complication, but to understand that idea of sort of varied benefits when we're thinking about diaspora and our engagement. And uh, so while diaspora communities can be, um, be our connections to source communities, as a lot of people are still, um, you know, go home and um, visit and are very deeply connected. In a lot of this work, we really must be collaborating with the persons or group who may whom the item may be returned to. So we're working together to understand the issues and concerns and motivations at play and exploring all the possible outcomes with the communities that it will be returned to. So this is an important um, difference for us at Birmingham because a lot of our engagement, like I said, is quite localized. Um, an example of how we've engaged with some of these questions in the past and um, taking on some of the conversations around um, blended culture, um, blended collection types to kind of serve a narrative um, purpose is the exhibition The Past is Now Birmingham in the British Empire, um, in which we kind of explored the environmental implications of colonialism um, through kind of a, a, a narrative that started with capitalism and carried on with kind of extractivism and exploiting of natural resources. And we use a number of natural science collections alongside decorative art collections and um, some anthropological collections to explore things around ivory trade, tortoise trade, um, rubber and cobalt, and a lot of these um, to try and bring into um, the space of the museum kind of the impact of these, uh, this exploitation and how we were kind of complicit in the narratives. However, I would say that this is quite an interesting one to think about from the diaspora community and it's it was not, you know, centered on the idea of restitution, though it was on decolonizing. Um, and actually, it really was kind of trying to pull out kind of Birmingham's role in the story. And when we do a lot of these um, research into our collection items, this is what we find is that a lot of the things that we have in Birmingham are based on a kind of local history context. We understand the people and how they had influence around the rest of the world as well as their influence on the kind of making of Birmingham through this colonial enterprise and that the collections are a result of that. Um, but kind of at the heart of all of this is to understand again this idea of the symbols and the symbolic in, um, in restitution and, re and return um, discourses. So there are different versions of um, of restitution claims that can be enacted. There are ones in which we maintain a caretaker role. Um, for example, ones where we return, we might return objects and then um, apply for a loan. And then we would actually, the objects would move very little or some of them would never move, but others would be returned. Um, and, but the symbolic um, ownership of the object would have been transferred legally and, um, that has in some situations been considered um, as an option that could be more satisfactory um, because of the importance of the kind of that symbol. 
And then there are others where there's an absolute severance of that caretaker responsibility. Um, for example, objects that need to be destroyed as they're um, um, as a part of the restitution claim. So thinking about objects that represent um, perhaps trapped ancestors that need to be laid to rest and so buried. And so in our understanding, they would be the accession from the museum that was returning them and to potentially to be laid to rest and never, um, not to be kind of engaged with in the future. Um, and these have really um, significant versions of, um, of the symbolic value of that kind of relationship from the past institution and the current um, and those who, um, who um, it was returned to. There's also a lot of discussion around facsimiles and replicas as practical solutions. Um, and it, when we're thinking about natural history um, and natural sciences, there's a lot um, in terms of kind of knowledge exchange and these really practical ways of getting the knowledge across. And these are really immediate and really practical ways of getting information across to people. But again, sometimes these have kind of deep symbolic repercussions. You know, where is the facsimile versus where is the original? Um, there might there's a lot of value in understanding that we might retain a facsimile if the if there is trust in the kind of in that real knowledge exchange that we want to still have access to the knowledge because we want to serve our diasporic communities but also have the indigenous knowledge be part of our continued research um, but um, return the original but in general the options on th how things have been um, practiced has been the opposite so for example the Tainoi sculptures um, in the institution institute of um, Jamaica that the originals are retained by the British Museum and the facsimiles are in Jamaica that has been called us um, into um, a lot of kind of conversations recently about how that is not acceptable and the originals should be in Jamaica and the facsimiles in uh, the UK. Um, because when it comes to a lot of the discourse that we want to engage people in, beyond the complications of um, um, some of the discourse around um, decolonizing and restitution versus repatriation is actually just is, is engaging people in the understanding of ownership, ownership of objects and ownership of knowledge. There is a lot of, um, there's a low awareness for some people about the collections at all in the UK, um, or even their sense of ownership for them in museum spaces. And so there's a big question about who has that sense of ownership currently. Um, and if we are engaging people in, in re restitution discussions, um, would there be a feeling of loss or is that sense of ownership not actually present to be lost? So there are a lot of interesting discussions that we can have. Um, so I know that the Charities Act 2022 has had some delays, but within it, the change that is supposed to create um, a lot more freedom for some museums to engage with um, uh, re restitution uh, more openly is this kind of moral obligation clause that's allowed in terms of ex gratita um, returning of um, objects as resources. Um, however, they've been quite open in the kind of the the discussions around it that this wouldn't um, allow vast objects of museums and material to be given back and that it would only be some a power that could be used in very rare cases. And within that kind of caveat, there is again this really important um, point of understanding what might be symbolically important to use this, this power of um, to exchange objects through kind of moral obligation and something that we might want to um, think about priorities that have deeper significance. So today's session um, was has been really um, centered on the, the, the questions around natural science and restitution. And much of the discourse, as, as has been discussed before, has focused on human remains or, or more anthropological collections. Um, and, you know, that division of collections is, is not necessarily something that is um, easy to see. Sometimes it's done quite arbitrarily in collection items themselves um, and might not be particularly helpful. But when we're thinking about it from this lens, they're kind of these central themes are you know, knowledge and the knowledge that can be derived from object based research is absolutely inherent in um, natural science collections, things that we can do active testing on to find out more information to kind of play into um, our understanding of ecological um, histories and, and the kind of crises we're feeding, uh, facing today, biodiversity crisis, etc. 
and it's symbolic of the value of indigenous knowledge. And in many ways, it can be, it is a counter narrative to colonial civilization projects when we have extracted, as uh, Saadi was really um, um, articulate about this morning, extracted the kind of the indigenous um, knowledge through some of the natural science collections and imposed the narrative of a colonial civilization education process and then created structures of power that hold those collections here and create a hierarchy of knowledge that allows us to kind of perpetuate some of these narratives. Um, but also there are humans in natural sciences and natural history. And whilst we are looking at um, objects that may not be humans, they represent kind of the interactions of humans with nature um, and knowledge and um, importantly kind of the the place that we have in this wider world where we like to separate out humans from culture and nature. And that's a kind of, again, an arbitrary division. We also make the case often about this universal museum model that is a case against repatriation so that objects can be seen together so that they can be understood in, um, in their proper context. And for natural sciences, this is particularly a poignant um, argument because of this idea of creating a, a, a complete collection that allows people to see a narrative across requires a sort of completest curatorial model in some ways, um, which is self-replicating, it's self-fulfilling. If we have all the collection items and so then we need the collection items to be seen um, in comparison to one another, then it will always be that the case that they will come to us. Whereas if we start the process of some restitution, then the case of universal models could be moved um, if we do truly believe that it, has, it serves scientific purposes. Um, and so there have been some engagements recently with some of our anthropological collections and working with um, communities um, outside of the kind of our typical diasporic um, engagement. And, we had a, um, within the pop-up for Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, we had the Savage Club um, work with this ancestor figure, Mataku. And this figure has been displayed many times. It has been, um, it was in the history of uh, the world in a hundred objects, the British Museum project. It was um, in an exhibition on Fiji that was held at the um, Sainsbury Center for Visual Arts, which was one of the most, um, one of the kind of biggest kind of collaborations between Fijian museums and um, a UK museum. And it was recently displayed again in Birmingham. We have this collection, this item is in our collection and it has been on tour for all of these other purposes. And our curators have been in deep conversations with the partners in the Fijian community who were working with us from the museum um, and as artists engaging in the project. And that um, the, the, the kind of the, history of display and engagement um, and placing this in a more critical and sometimes um, and self-aware space as it was done in the Salvage Club has given space for these discussions to move forward and to be more kind of um, working towards a solution of return. So we're not necessarily at that, but the kind of criti critical mass of, of the engagement with this piece is possibly going to translate into um, some in a new future. So we're really hopeful. Um, and again, this is something that was done in terms of collaboration, but kind of leading on to Joyce's presentation later, also the power of engaging with artists to make this kind of engagement um, easier to understand, have a wider um, kind of um, impact. And so that's kind of where I want to close. Um, I. I truly believe that actually within some, this engagement and working with our um, different source communities that are relevant after doing this sort of proactive research into preparing for claims that um, ha based on research in our collections that we were gonna need to work with, our, um, with artists to help um, this kind of wider engagement because the power of artists is, you know, in this ability to reimagine the world that we live in and the futures that we're a part of making. Museums are quite concerned um, with the future, despite holding a lot of um, objects about the past, and we we are kind of a good place of trying to create a temporal link, um, but also to really engage with how we have been um, implicit in this colonial enterprise and these um, this extraction, and how we can be a part of working to reconcile 
um, towards reconciliation and justice um, through kind of deeper engagement, participation, and working with the diaspora, but actually prioritizing communities of origin. Um, so that's where I'm going to end my presentation, and it will be wonderful to be a part of the conversation later with Joyce. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, apologies to you and to the audience for that interruption in the middle of your uh, presentation, just so we could see your slides better, but wonderful job. I'm looking forward to um, engaging you with some questions um, and takeaways uh, later. And now let's go ahead and have Joyce uh, Treasure uh, bring up the rear with talking about art and engagement. Welcome, Joyce. Thank you, Katie, and it's good to see you. You um, too. And uh, thank you to Rachel. That was really interesting. Uh, that uh, the, the the process and methods of uh, considering how to uh, reinstitute artifacts. Um, uh, so I'm gonna uh, hopefully share my screen. Just let me know that this is working, please. I'm able to see it. If you could just expand the screen, that would be great. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So, yeah. Um, my name is Joyce Treasure, as I've already been introduced, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to Birmingham Museum Trust and Afford for inviting, inviting me here today. Um, and I'm honored to participate in today's important discussion to address uh, restitution, repatriation, reparation, redress, repair within the African uh, natural science. Um, and um, I'll, I will be, I'll be presenting all the leaves, which was commissioned through Birmingham Museum Trusts as part of Cut, Copy, Remix. And that was care of, and thanks to Emily Bedos Davis, who I met in 2019. She was curator of modern and contemporary art at the uh, Birmingham Museum Trust. And she's now left and she's curator of visual arts at Cheltenham Trust. Um, just so you've got a, 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 little understand, a little little understanding, Cut, Copy, Remix is a separate program from Devolving Restitution that invites artists to explore the creative potential of Birmingham Museum Trust's digital image resource, making use of their out of copy artworks for free under Creative Commons Zero license. And they have over 3,500 objects that are available as free digital, uh, for free, in free digital use. Um, what I will do is I will begin my presentation by giving a very brief overview of my relevant past work, uh, followed by my partial sharing of my process and engagement with the African Natural Collection um, and how that has helped shape how that uh, currently looks um, at the moment. So between 2000 and 2007 and 2010, um, I set up a community interest company called Treasure Films that offered film training to young people. One of the films that was produced was Welcome to England, and that uh, centers on an intergenerational, intergenera intergenerational project with older African and Caribbean people from West London's Pepper Pot Day Center, working with uh, uh, primary school children who helped create the film. And the film focuses on the older people's experience of moving to England and helping to shape the community in W10 Labrick Grove. And I wanted to uh, mention that project because, and, and I can, it's been echoed throughout the day um, that it's, you know, it's, it, it's important to have um, projects that involve local community that sit outside of these institutions. Um, and then in 2012, I began to make commercial work, uh, as well as being involved in residencies that critically and politically examined social structures of power and knowledge and colonialism. Uh, during this time, 
I felt my work needed to be grounded um, academically. I am not academic at all. So um, it was uh, at the time I was I was I was deciding whether to do academia or an MA in art. And, and I've and I've got quite an extensive experience working in uh, the art world. And so I decided to do academia because um, it felt more relevant at that time. And so I began uh, my Black Studies degree in 2017 and graduated in 2020. Uh, prior to my degree, I completed a four month research trip, which I labeled a Roman pilgrimage. And I visited Haiti, New York, Senegal, Gambia, Ghana, and Nigeria. And that has formed part of my research. I'd taken a DNA test in 2016 and located my ancestral heritage in Africa, Britain, Scotland, Sweden, and Denmark. Um, these findings form the backdrop to my practice. Um, and then through a VR spot residency with Strix in January this year, I combined virtual performance, writing and film to bridge the separate dis disciplines in my practice. The residency also acted as a springboard to experiment with um, technology that draws on ritual, traditional African beliefs and justice. So all the leaves initial initial proposal for cut copy remix um, was in response to exploring El Monte's ethnobotany and the Afro-Cuban science of the concrete. What a title. They always have such crazy titles, these papers. Um, my engagement seeked to reveal plant classifications dependent on Birmingham's museum's digital archive findings and their multiple associations with ritual medicine and other aspects of African culture, namely Yoruba and Congo. Um, however, Rodriguez Maguel's critical analysis of Cabrera's intellectual positioning, which the paper I was exploring heavily relies on, debunks Cabrera's argument, which is interesting because El Monte is labeled the Santera Bible. So it was interesting to come across this critical analysis, but I wasn't able to dig any further. Um, so I wish to veer away from that, my initial response, and instead rely further on my, on my own research, including some of my current readings, but not exclusively. And that is um, Flash of the Spirit by Robert Farris Thomas, um, Sentient Flesh, Thinking in Disorder, po Poesis in Black by R.A. Judy, and Costume in Performance, Materiality, Culture and Body by Donatella Barberi. Um, for this engagement, um, I, realized, I relied instead on uh, intuition, practice-based research, often starting from a place of imagination, materials that already exist in my, in my uh, database, um, and my engagement with the collection all rooted in African Yoruba spiritual, uh, spiritual traditions, such as Ifa. And um, I got this quote from a short film. I'll share, I'll share the uh, link in the chat when I finished. And it's an interesting uh, film made by uh, Tunde Kalani, uh, looking at some of the history of science in uh, Yoruba Ifa. And, uh, on that film, it, it quotes, the Yoruba recognizes Ifa as a repository of Yoruba, traditional body of knowledge, embracing history, philosophy, medicine, and folklore. So for my uh, engagement with the collection at Birmingham Museum Trust, I was instinctively drawn to the cross-section of an elephant skull. Um, and this was donated by Reverend Henry Wilson, who wrote um, a really appalling poem typical of the colonial mindset of that time titled The Congo's Need, taken from Triumphs of the Gospel in the Belgian Congo. The primary goal of uh, these early missionaries was to bring the so-called heathen African people up to the same levels of spiritual awareness 
as the rest of society. So some of my research is also interested in syncretism um, and how the blending of different religions, cultures and schools of thought um, transverse. And I mean, I mean, I'm especially interested in how African spiritual beliefs adopted European belief systems and the process in which in which that all took place. Um, interestingly, there's a snake named after Henry Wilson, known as the now, excuse my um, pronunciation, known as the Hypotophis Wilsoni, <laughs> common name the African big headed the African big head snake. And you can find this, uh, you can find the vernacular and science names of reptiles across the globe in the eponym dictionary of reptiles. And the book helps to identify persons, uh, the persons, the animals are named after. So you can see that colonialism is really ingrained into the fabric of, uh, of our culture. So this is, um, we started doing this 3D scanning using an app called Polycam app. And that was uh, courtesy of uh, Steamhouse who supported, who supported that process. We had planned to use a state-of-the-art 3D scanner, which costs an absolute fortune, by the way, um, but it was broken. So we had to use this uh, the, uh, an app called Polycam, and it's free. It's an uh, IDAR and 3D scanner that you can use on most smartphones and, and with remarkable results. Um, we scanned also, and we scanned a blue kingfisher and a white throated bee eater donated by um, a guy called Percy Talbot, collected uh, from this time, from his, from his time in the Oban region of Nigeria, and who also wrote The Shadows of the Bush. Uh, the titles of the book gives an, an, an insight into the anthropo anthropological readings of the writer uh, during the time. Um, and you can, I, 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 what I did is I, I used, um, uh, I used a, I created a video clip using keyframe. You use these keyframes, and then it gives you a kind of more smooth uh, video clip that you can use uh, in your own way, which we'll see later on in the film. Or you can try and move the. Uh, I'll send a link to actually to all the uploads that I've done of the work, just so that it's more accessible to anyone that wants to use it. Um, but when I was visiting uh, Birmingham stores to engage in their collection, I was reading a uh, flash of the spirit that I mentioned before, and I was looking at the Arisha Osanyin, the herb god, the, her the herb god, um, and it was about to be mentioned in the book. But overall, the book uh, looks at five African civilizations, Yoruba, Congo, Ija'am, uh, Mande, and Cross River. And the skins uh, that we were looking at um, in the collection, they're quite beautiful, the skins, actually, considering how they got there and, and what they actually are. Um, but the skins that we were looking at that was that were that were donated by Percy Talbot uh, were, were obtained in the region of um, Aban, which is part of uh, Cross River. And so I looked into this a little bit more and Cross River National Park is a large area of uh, rainforest that is part of uh, Nigeria and Cameroon. This rainforest is important uh, closed canop canopy where the, the trees, uh, meaning the trees uh, grow closely together. And the park is recognized internationally as a biodiverse hotspot. There are lots of different kinds of plants there um, primates, amphibians, butterflies, fish, and small mammals. And Obam is one of the richest and most um, ornithologically diverse sites in the country. So the density of the the density of large mammals species there in Oban are very low due to widespread hunt, widespread hunting. 
So despite being an invaluable site for conservation um, of forest and elephants, Oban is uh, poorly protected and neglected. And, um, you know, it's it's it, it, it might be interesting to see how these I, these ideas of restitution engage with uh, these spaces that are actually uh, poorly uh, funded. So um, in the late 1990s, for example, surveys estimated that the park had 74 elephants and every year three to four elephants are killed in addition to uh, poaching, habitat loss and farming and logging. So my research is uh, interested in studying trauma as a way to heal. Um, and I was interested to read that the Yoruba in the name, in Asanyin's name, undertook a vast study of the leaves, herbs and roots of the forest, classifying them according to their therapeutic um, properties. So who is Asanyin? Um, Asanyin is a one-legged, one-armed uh, Arisha, and he has one huge ear, and he has uh, one small ear. The huge ear can hardly ear anything, and the small ear ears everything. Um, so... For those that are unfamiliar, the Orishas are natural forces or demigod, demigods that act as intermediate, intermediaries between God or Aludame and humanity. I have to interrupt, Joyce. Can we, uh, uh, unfortunately, because of the, the timing of the speakers that need to come on next, could I ask you to wrap it up in about two minutes, please? Yeah, okay. So, right, well, I'll get straight to the film. I'll start. I'll, I'll, there was there's more information about Aludame, but I'll just step straight into the film, and I'm going to attempt to uh, work on an app which uh, helps to uh, draw in some sound because um, I wasn't able. I didn't have time to do the sound. There's a little bit of sound, but not 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 all a lot.
So I'm trying to stop the film. That's that's the end of the film. I want to go down to the last page. There. So thank you. I look forward to having a conversation. Thank you so much, Joyce, for your presentation. That film was uh, really beautiful. Um, I'd like to take to thank both you and Rachel for your presentations, even with all the sort of like changes and interruptions that we've um, had to go through. I just wanted to ask uh, Rebecca and Janice, do we have time for a question or do you just want me to do some takeaways uh, from both the presentations? Um, I, I think we have at least five minutes for questions, so please go ahead. Um, great. Uh, so I, I won't be selfish. First, I'll, um, I'll open it up if there's anyone who has a question that they want to ask. I'd be happy to um, present it to them. I see Anthony has put one in the chat. Um, a, a more of a statement than a question. He says, we have the Kaya forests in the Eastern coast of Africa. They were used for rituals, conservation, and pharmacology. These sacred spaces were cathedrals made out of natural trees and botanical richness. I would love to hear more about such. Um, I'm not sure if either of you have any knowledge um, of that or wanna speak to that. Okay, well, Anthony, I hope you're able to get um, more knowledge about that. I want, uh, there is one, uh, there's several questions that I have, but one of the ones that are on my mind is about, um, Rachel, you talked about decreasing um, some of the barriers to uh, communicating about uh, the issues around engagement and repatriation. And Joyce, you are, of course, an artist, and we saw that amazing uh, film um, about the birds and forests and the Dahomey. I was wondering if you had both thought about sort of like practical ways in which art could um, lower the barriers of communication, meaning for non-English speakers in presenting some of the challenges or uh, issues around um, repatriation, restoration um, in, a, in a sort of public way. Um, Rachel? <laughs> um, well, I think, I think art is probably one of the key elements to this, but um, I guess there is something about an artist like Joyce um, and others who take a lot of um, really complex things that they're hearing and metabolizing, you know, some of these um, colonial texts that Joyce I was really, in, uh, you know, uh, felt really in, in, like um, in awe of you for me to read all of those to metabolize them into something that would inspire your work. And I think there's something in that transformation that an artist can do for things that maybe a lot of us don't have the time for, some of us don't have the um, emotional bandwidth for, or the ability to translate what we might be feeling as an emotional response to some of this kind of violence into something that other people could maybe access um, to an extent. And I think that's something that's really um, important. I think we're gonna have to use things beyond art to get into the details and the specifics eventually. But I think art is like possibly the way that we get more people involved in the conversation or at least understanding the emotional um, importance and the symbolic value of being a part of this conversation and having your voice um, as a participant in questions about the ownership of these symbolic things or kind of these questions of power and um, and um, healing after this kind of violence. I agree, thank you. Uh, Joyce, did you want to add anything or, or speak to that question? Um, well, I think that uh, it, it, to kind of re reiterate Rachel really that it is it's an easy um, an easier process not easy not easy it's an easier process to bridge the gap between um, institutions and the public um, to use art uh, in a way that the public feel that the art speaks to them. So I think in the past it's been difficult to bring certain audiences into these institutions because the art wasn't speaking to them. Um, they couldn't recognize themselves in the art. And so it's it's only in this recent times or it, present times that that started to change. And it's, um, it's good to see as well. Um, uh, you know, art, music always has a language that, um, 
doesn't use terminologies that alienate people otherwise so i think i think it is important but it can't be a, it can't be that alone of course because you know you do need the um more academic process or the more uh, method the, the methodology more so to kind of then consider how how you move forward in a in a way that's um um you know as as longevity Oh, I agree. And for me, it was uh, more about how art can be an integral part of the process or the one of the pillars of public engagement. And um, because one of the key issues around just the whole idea of curation and caretaking is a very colonial ways in which uh, we, I would say like this country, if you will, and many others think about caretaking in a sense of um, it's ownership, it's ownership, but not really, or you're not properly able to take care of this. You don't understand its value or what it needs. And we have the, um, facilities, um, yeah, due to years of exploitation, you have those things. Um, but in terms of opening up to the public, and I was thinking a lot about Rachel said about barriers to, um, having the conversations with people because so much of it is in English and by using sort of visual or audible, uh, audio art forms like music, taking some of the issues around repatriation and restoration and using those and infusing art um, to, or infusing those things into the art to open up the conversations, not just um, having um, people from these formerly colonized nations see themselves in the art inside the museum, but understand sort of like what is um, at stake and um, open up the conversation so that there is a, a little less antagonism uh, around it. Um, because in many ways on both sides, there's a lot around national identity that's tied up um, in these issues and, and fear of what um, that changing sense of, uh, or redefining that sense of identity might mean for, um, you know, either nation on, on either end. Um, I actually do think that we do need to be, you know, um, engaging in, in languages outside of English a lot more. And the reasons that we stop doing it is often because we, um, we don't understand the other language. Yeah. And we're worried that things will be communicated that we won't understand. And if we understand that that's the fear we have, of not of, of not communicating in English, then that's obviously going to be mirrored. Yeah, <laughs> of course. If we feel it, then they feel it on the other side the opposite. No, I think that's completely right. Um, and I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, for the sake of time, I will probably just uh, text my my other questions or points in the chat. I know that we do have to move on to Sarah, but again, I'd like to thank everyone for um, your participation and for being here and listening today. And thank you very much to Rachel and Joyce for your wonderful presentations um, and what we need to think about in terms of realistically tackling engagement um, around repatriation. Thank you again. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Cardian, uh, for chairing that session. Uh, I'm now handing it over to Sarah and Zach for the last comments coming up, uh, the discussion that came out of today's uh, presentations and perhaps shutting out the way forward from, from now onwards and moving further with this devolving restitution uh, kind of discussion. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm gonna speak on behalf of um, uh, Zach and myself together. Um, just wanted to reflect a little bit. I know we don't have very much time, so I'll keep my comments short. Wanted to reflect a little bit on the richness of the conversation today. Um, it really has been an extremely rich and Im important conversation with such a kind of depth of expertise from around the world, from artists, science policy folks, to curators, to, um, you know, uh, activists. It's a really important to make time for these conversations and to be having them in such uh, depth and with such serious ethical intention. It's also quite difficult emotionally. Um, these conversations that uh, bring us to dwell on colonial violence are often 
painful. You know, there is joy and there's been joy in many of the presentations today and they can be liberatory. Um, and, you know, that's why we're doing them is because ultimately we want to embark on a process of healing, deep emotional healing, collective healing. Um, but it takes a bit of bravery, it takes a bit of bravery on the part of all the speakers today, all the participants to bring ourselves to uh, this kind of uh, conversation where some of us are speaking from, you know, positions or subjectivities where we don't know, uh, you know, we might be a natural scientist and we don't know so much about decolonizing or we might be a, know a lot about decolonizing but know less about, um, you know, um, natural science collections and what language should be used and this matters. So I just want to thank everybody who's brought their full selves to this, because without this sort of first step of bravery and commitment to a process, which is essentially a sort of truth and reconciliation process, uh, we, we won't get to the next uh, stage, we won't get to that healing. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, well worth, I think, celebrating and remarking on, on in the first place. I also just wanted to reflect a little bit on um, the people of Birmingham in all of this that uh, what maybe hasn't been said, and it's just a basic factor that I wanted to bring into the room, is that about 9% of the population of Birmingham are black people. And, um, you, know, I'm, you know, here in Birmingham, we sort of so know this, that we perhaps haven't even thought to mention it in the room. And there may well be people who don't know this at all about Birmingham. Uh, we repeat it often uh, when we talk nationally, but actually you know we forget not everybody knows everything about this place as you know we like to think uh, we are familiar with the place that we you know are, are kind of representing and of those nine percent of people three percent of the population of Birmingham are from African diaspora this gives us an incredible mandate for this work um, and it's also worth what really came home to me today is that because of the laws that govern the national museums uh, and limit at the moment and for the time being, uh, the operations around restitution and repatriation collections in national museums in London. Birmingham is the largest of the major national partner museums, in other words, the museums outside of those laws, outside of national museums, that have the largest um, population of diaspora people in the cities in the UK. Let me say that more clearly. This is the most black and brown city in the UK where we are not governed by the laws that govern the national museum collections. That's very significant. That puts us in a really significant leadership role uh, to step into this role, to set the tone for the rest of the museum sector in the UK. So that's why it's really um, been a very important occasion for us today to come together with these world-class thinkers, brilliant leading thinkers, um, on this topic. And we've had some conversations here that we haven't even had internally. You know, uh, we haven't even necessarily, I don't know if Joyce Treasure, for instance, has met Lucas Large. Um, maybe they have, but I'm not aware. Uh, so this has been a real education for me, uh, been a real education, I'm sure, for my colleagues at the museum, and also for uh, I hope, you know, very worthwhile for everybody who's been tuning in. So I won't say more just now. Uh, I want to give the last uh, words to Victoria Peary, because she said in her presentation, um, we want them, the artefacts, to make meaningful contribution to life. And I think that just sums up beautifully what today uh, has been about. Uh, so I will Oh, uh, so I, I'm being told that Lucas and Joyce do know each other. So I'm very happy about that. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave it there. And thank you all very much and congratulate you, uh, the devolving restitution team on this whole series. Thank you to everybody. And um, I think that's down to me to close the session, but perhaps somebody else wants to do the formal, formal closing. Thanks again. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for that reflection. I think without further ado, unless if there's anything else that we need to follow up amongst the participants and the other partners we're speaking today, uh, we've come to the end of the devolving restitution um, series, uh, series number six. 
And thank you so much for the speakers for today. And thank you so much for the audience who managed to sit with us from around 9.30 a.m. up to now. And we look forward for many other bigger conversations in the future around the idea of uh, repatriation and restitution and the decolonization question in European museums and also in African museums about the collections and how we need to think about communities, not only involving them, but also giving them power to decide how and when they want the collections to be displayed or to be interpreted from their own kind of epistemological understandings. Thank you so much and goodbye for now.